stuff, stuff like that. But what he, what a lot of people started d- d- digging and a lot of people going after him um, were going like, wait a minute. Her Patreon was sort of taking a dip, right? And then it jacked up. And she was got, and people, and a lot of her fans got pissed off at her. She was doing this game called Flip It or Rip It, and she ripped a very expensive, very rare car, and people were pissed off about it. Ew. Flip It or Rip It is basically, um, you've played like a trading card game, right? Uh, I baseball cards, basketball cards, stuff okay, like same that. Same thing with base, baseball cards. Let's say right. like you open up a baseball card, right? Some baseball cards, right? And you're flipping through it, and like a Derek Jeter card comes up. Okay. Right? And then you got a, uh, you got Derek Jeter and uh, uh, Sammy Sosa, right? Okay. And what to say the Sammy Sosa card? It's a flip. You can keep, right? But your Jeter. Is that's this a white or black? Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> and you get your and your because it matters. <laughs> your Jeter comes up, right? Comes rip. So now you've got this r- really nice Derek Jeter card. Right. Rip it. Flip or rip it. And so people lo- left her Patreon for that? Lost their, well, it's an awful game because she also gets cards for free from, okay. from Coast. Okay. So she got this very expensive, very rare card. So, like, basically it's a first edition Ken Griffey Jr. rookie card. Rip. How? Rip. It, it, it's, it, it, like, I don't want to hear about the patriarchy anymore. Like, can you imagine, like, how many... It's a conspiracy theory at the, at the least. I was thinking about this today. I want to know... What Ron Paul girls are out there right now sitting on six figures because they were doing low-key cam work for the libertarian movement in 2009 and got, like, three bitcoins donated to them. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. That's the other thing. It's like the patriarchy, like, it's like, well, define what that is. Because right. Because you might as well just you'd be, you might as well be Alex Jones screaming, the freaking Illuminati, the Illuminati. <laughs> You know, and it's like, define the patriarchy. Right. What is the patriarchy? What is this thing, you know? And it's, I and mean, when you're trying to have, like, a civil debate, like, I will de- have a civil debate with feminists, and there's some feminists, like, I regard, like, like uh, some people's, like, well, how can you listen to S- Steph, Dr. Stephanie Murphy and talk about uh, um, feminism, but not M.K. Lords? And be like, because M.K. Lords is out of her fucking mind. <laughs> and, you know, and she's trying to, and she's trying to break this bullshit like, well, people only respected me because I used, I first started off with the words M.K. and people thought it was a guy. I'm like, that's fucking bullshit. <laughs> I never heard of your fucking ass in my fucking life until you really started getting around. And you're trying I, to- I, I took your suggestion. I watched some Crowder. And he's kind of a douchebag. Yeah. Uh, but. He did this one where he went to campus and it was changed my mind. Yes, and that it was, series is brilliant. And where he basically goes to a college campus and just has like a conversation, and you just see the like the left's impulses to silence, like. Mm-hmm. It's, but it's the he, first move. The first move is. Do you have a permit for this? Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was just having like this really thoughtful conversation with this uh, transgender man. Oh, the genderless, bald-headed person. Yeah, <laughs> I get. Yeah, I didn't. I. I mean, and and I. I found myself somewhere in between because she's right. He's right. Like, just like if you if it's like Maya, for instance. Like, if you want to be called she, and those are the pronouns you want, like, why wouldn't I be respectful of you? You know, like yes. the people who go out of their way to go. Oh, uh, he, you kid you me. It's like, yeah. you're a dick. Like, even now, if I don't like Maya, but, mm-hmm. like, I wouldn't disrespect her in that way because that's so – right. I, so I got that point. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm totally down with the biology argument. It's like there's two and a half. <laughs> you know, there's 2.008 gen- genders uh, – well, sexes. Right. And that, uh, that's – sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm no, you're fine. You wanna, I feel bad. Keep no, going. you're fine. No, I'm just saying, like – the, I'm, I could go on a train about this. Train you're, stuff. you're male, you're female, or you're one of the point zero eight. And we have a listener who's actually uh, in the, who has is it Klingerman's Kleinerman's? I don't know. Or they're basically like the colloquial term, the inter, like the term that's offensive to them is hermaf- his intersex. hermaphrodite. Yeah. So intersex, uh, intersex. Or, okay. Intersex, or uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, and like it was f- a fascinating discussion that I had with it, this listener. You know. How did that listener feel about our discussion about trans? You know, they feel like oh, we, uh, the, they never they, listen to that one, or they, no? They they, they listen because it. they like us. They oh. do not like a lot of our other listeners, <laughs> or at least the people on my Facebook who pick fights f- because they want to be offensive. So, 
Yeah, a lot of them want to pick uh, fights just to be offensive. Yeah, exactly. They just, or they just want to pick fights. Exactly. You know? But that's... Which is, like, one good thing about the Discord. Mm-hmm. You know? Especially when Reinhold goes, like, I want to pick a fight with you. Why? I don't know. Say a topic. <laughs> I'm like... Whee! The crux of Jones's problem. All right, this guy Democrats cool. have done this type um, of we campaigning also hit 100 people for decades. in the Discord finally this weekend. They what? We hit 100 people. Oh wow, cool. Oh right. Um, hold on, I'm setting some stuff up here. Just because I don't go to church every yeah, that's without thing. any like, doubt, that's like the biggest problem. Is, like some people in the trans community is really is that they understand mm-hmm. the biology action. You won't get them like kind of like Blair like, but like I'm talking about trans community 2005 mm-hmm. okay before like it really blew up they a lot of people in the trans community then was saw no, they, right. you transfer into two you know you transfer to one or two genders right mm-hmm. you pick one right it's not i like it's like well i'm inner fluid then it's like okay then you're just a cross dresser right well, no no i'm fluid and i'm in between <laughs> go see a therapist <laughs> you need to see your thing. All right, you ready? We got to get started. We got a lot to do tonight. We have a lot to do. You want to do a lot. Uh, yes. You want to do a lot. And, uh, You're just before, salty before, bec- because oh. we're talking Roy Moore. Oh, You're salty. I'm actually salty. Actually, I left my lotion in the car. Do you have any lotion in I here? I do. That I could use because uh, I know lotion uh, is very important. You see that? You're getting ashy. You see that? You, you see get ashy. Sh- well, and it's very sh- humid sh- in here for my nosebleed. So, uh, I'm such a. I'm such a. I, like I. Yeah, if you go in there, there's lotion. Okay. There's uh, I don't know if it would be in the bathroom. Yeah, it's in the bathroom. It's in the closet. I don't have a lotion sponsor at this point. I don't know. We should have a lotion sponsor. Uh, you can look at that basket or the one that's in the, uh, in the closet. There's man lotion, there's, uh... Are you all Christians here? Yes. Is Roy Moore a good Christian? Yes, absolutely. Nobody's in the nobody's on the video. This is very odd. That's the crux of Jones's problem. Democrats have done this type of campaigning for decades, and many black voters don't know what makes Doug Jones different from the generation of Democrats that preceded him. Are you gonna vote for Doug Jones or Roy Moore? Who me? Yeah. Crux of Jones's problem, like Randall Woodfin, Birmingham's popular new mayor. No black voter outreach visiting some african-american churches and neighborhoods appearing with playgrounds closed down on your moisture i mean you just look at the neighborhood it's just going expensive jones is doing your traditional black voter outreach lebron is still getting better no he's not lebron sucks get over it are you fired up tonight (laughs) angry black man lebron sucks like, you can beat him, I could beat LeBron real easily. Kick him in his million-dollar knee. Uh, <laughs> Which is the funniest part of Barstool Sports. You ever watch that one where he's doing the, um, um, uh, what was he, was he boxing? Yeah, uh, they were doing that training stuff, and he goes, oh, yeah. oh my million-dollar knee. <laughs> <laughs> Who, McAfee? Yeah, yeah. my million-dollar <laughs> I was on the ground rolling. That's so funny. Yeah, that's a funny, dude. All uh, right, here we go. You know, it needs more. It needs more vibber. To be be- you know, Are we like v- v- said no one ever. Yeah, no one's. <laughs> yeah, we've been rolling for like ten minutes. Have we? Have yep. We? Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I am your whoa. I was going to say the show doesn't really truly start till Vibbert, you know, calls in. Yeah. No shit. No, there's zero people watching. I hope I'm in the right group. Are you streaming to the record? I hope so. You... There's zero people. That's not normal. Oh, man. Check, please. Fine, then just stream to Twitch. <laughs> Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves while putting people before political parties. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective with the goal of leaving you better informed so you can go out and be smarter when you talk to your friends. 
Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and become a subscriber on Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. Without your financial support, independent media like this cannot exist. In exchange for supporting our program, we give you great bonus content. This show is crowdsourced, so you can send us news with the hashtag WALnews or in our Facebook group or Discord channel. We are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. You can also message the Facebook page. Lots of ways to get a hold of us. Please be warned that this show is raw, unedited, and authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. In this show, we're going to cover the Alabama Senate race. We're going to cover the collapsing integrity of mainstream media. We're going to cover, uh, gee, what else? We're going to cover the inner workings of Trump's day in the White House. Great article by the New York Times. And we're going to start with the Daniel Shaver shootings. But first, I want to uh, introduce my lovely co-host, Harry Price. Harry, how are you? Going good, going good, going good. I perused your... Um you know, daily care products in the bathroom. Yes, you you were getting ashy, you said, so you needed some product. Yep, yep, I needed some lotion right there, and I couldn't decide which one of Dear Leader's moisturizers and lotions that he had in there. Mm-hmm. He had like four different lotions, three different mo- moisturizers, two different beard oils, okay? Oh, yeah. You know, and one dried up thing of a Harry Shave Cream left. Uh, yeah, well, Harry Harry's makes a good product, uh, but I have forsaken it for my beard, which y- you can tell is excellent and well-oiled. Mm-hmm. What I actually am doing instead of the beard oil, because the beard oil kind of smells weird at the end of the day, is I'm just rubbing uh, coconut oil in it in the shower in the mornings. Mm. It's getting nice and moist, and uh, it looks great the rest of the day. It's great. So I'm, I'm really enjoying having a beard. And let me tell you, the ladies on Bumble, boys, if you, it took me till 32 to be able to grow a beard. Like, I've never really been a man. Uh, but I've always been confused with a lesbian. In fact, I was in a same-sex marriage, uh, essentially. If you look at photos of me in my 20s with my ex-wife, it was basically, oh, look, there's two cute lesbians. <laughs> oh, look at those cute lesbians at the Republican parade. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> and then I grew a beard, and now all of a sudden everybody considers me a man. So it still hasn't affected my voice. Still cracking. Well, I watch uh, at work. I stream a bunch of different YouTube shows. Like I'll stream Vice, I'll stream uh, Dem- Democracy Now, I'll stream Ben Shapiro. And every time Ben Shapiro comes on, my my coworker Jason walks in and goes, "Is that you talking at one and a half speed?" And I'm like, <laughs> and he he's he's legitimately thinks it's my voice. So thankfully, I hopefully have a better cadence than he does. Oh, uh, you 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 definitely do. Well. Uh, welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all the irrelevance modern politics to while putting people before political parties. We examine you current events. But first, Birchbox. Uh, no, like, <laughs> he's, I, I really like Ben Shapiro. I think he's a very intellectually consistent conservative thinker. Uh, much like the guys at National Review, for instance, don't always agree with him, but at least he makes you think. He's not like Breitbart. If you're yeah. reading Breitbart, that's cancer. Yeah. He makes you think, and he, he, I do like his protective. I like to read his stuff more than listen to because I can't stand his cadence. Yeah. I, I will suffer through his audio just because I want the information that's going through his head. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's just where it is. Yeah. yeah so, uh, Wonderkind. That's all I can say about that. Yeah. So, lo- yes, I am a hoarder. I love to test things out. I love to spend. Uh, I love to, you know, there was a time in my life where I did a lot of uh, self-medicating with shopping. Got very into moisturizing at one period uh, a couple years ago. So, yeah, I got I got a lot of moisturizer in there. So anytime you come over, especially in the wintertime. Mm-hmm. But you know my house is always moist because I've got uh, the humidifier running. Three humidifiers. 24-7 in here because I don't want to get the nosebleeds. He's got one in his bedroom. I think I saw like a mini one here in the living room. And everything is coated in a white dust now because when you run the humidifier and it puts that, it puts all the deposits in the air, all that white distilled water. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna like I two gallons a day of distilled water. No, thank you. That's easy. What do you think I am, Rockefeller? I, I do two gallons of distilled water for okay. Gunther's room. Well, that's a baby, okay? Gunther I have ca- gets distilled water. Of course, Gunther. Gunther should have whatever she wants. She should have Perrier water in her humidifier <laughs> if she wants it. I'm surprised you don't do that. Gets Perrier in her uh, um, bottle. <laughs> so, so yes, uh, everything's coded. Bitcoin's going well. I'm, I'm, I'm. I switched over to Litecoin. My my Coinbase is at. One hundred ninety-eight dollars. 
Nice. Which means I rode Bitcoin up from nine, mm -hmm. sold it off, put it into Litecoin, and I, I put in fifty dollars, rode all that up to one hundred and ninety eight. Nice. I'm killing it. Look at you. I know. I'm uh, quite the investor. So Look at you. All right. So yes, I know. Rural King sells get distilled water, Boss Hog uh, Junior, at uh, for eighty nine <laughs> cents. But I'm not spending two dollars a day. I can just wipe things down okay i'm right. used to white residue everywhere all right so let's get started um i'm gonna start with a real bummer uh so and, and it's a pretty outrageous story that i i didn't know anything about until one of our followers tweeted me uh and said hey you've got to check this out i think it was saturday that i got saturday or sunday i got the tweet uh, of this video of a shooting in Arizona, and it's pretty disturbing, and we're going to play some of the audio, which is very chilling. And, you know, here's the We Are Libertarian stance on cops, and Harry, back me up. Uh, the You cannot group everybody into one thing, okay? Harry's drinking his Perrier water about ready to, to go off. Okay, so you cannot say all cops are good or all cops are bad because that's not how human beings work. That's very communistic of you to lump everybody into one group. But there is a very serious problem in society with policing. And you look at the rise of the warrior cop by Radley Balco talking about how, you know, this one government policy where starting with Reagan, they started selling military grade weapons to uh, police departments and the militarization of, of things and the war on drugs has just turned our police departments into occupying forces in many cases. And it's a very serious problem. And when you put people into tactical vests with tactical weapons, they start acting tactical and they stop treating citizens like citizens when their job is the front lines of protecting your Fourth Amendment rights, your First Amendment rights, all of your constitutional rights to now treating us like we are an occupying village, occupied village. This isn't tactical. Uh, this video, um, I've watched this. You can mm -hmm. just watch 14-year-olds play uh, Rainbow Six. That's tactical. Right. This wasn't tactical. Yeah, this was <laughs> sloppy. Yeah, this was sloppy. Um, yeah, uh, it's more of a, a, we're not against cops. We're against assholes. Just like any <laughs> right. ideology, you can't group them all together. It's like not every Democrat's a, a, a scumbag, but if they're, if they're an asshole and they want to use the force, you know, like to use force the government to be an asshole about it, yeah, just like the same thing. Where Except Republicans. communist, where every communist forfeits their right to be a moral agent, therefore they should be if destroyed. They, if I'm their communist kidding. society is voluntary and it's over there in the corner, <laughs> all and right, could all voluntary right. leave and voluntary get in, cool, I'm fine with it. You have your little communist commune. All it's right. when they start using like the force and force everyone into it. That's the problem. Take, of course, they take, have to force people into it to get it to work. But anyways, but the, mittens, take the keys out of the chopper. He already <laughs> said no this time. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's the uh, the biggest thing. Yeah, that's the stance. It's yeah, and that's the correct stance because even if uh, your perfect libertarian society, there's going to be enforcement agencies, mm -hmm. and it's more of a how do you want the you know it's you can't lump everyone together into one different group. And even now, granted, um, attacking people just on that because they lumped people together, that's that's sad because well, one, it's it happens because this is what humans brain do. It's right. very it's very easy to lump them in together, and when the when police officers they you also see them try they also do they do that too and that whole uh blue line um blue uh, the thin blue line culture that yeah. that line puts them and us versus each other and that's their that's that mentality pushed onto the community right which is also like now like i get it like some of them are like well that's our line of brothers but yeah but it's kind of makes it really feel it's us versus you then yeah, and we're going to we're going to get into more reaction. So let's set this up and then we'll get into some of the reaction yeah. from the right, which has actually been incredibly anti-police in this case. Uh Not anti-police, anti-asshole. <laughs> right. Okay. So he, so here we go. Uh there this video came out. An officer was acquitted of second degree murder charges last week. Uh, officials in Arizona released graphic videos showing Daniel Shaver crawling on the on his hands and knees and begging for his life in the moments before he was shot and killed by police in January of 2016. 
He was one of 963 police fatal shootings in 2016, according to a Washington Post database. And uh, the Arizona shooting by Philip, quote unquote, Mitch Brailsford, then an officer with the Mesa Police Department, occurred after officers responded to a call about a man allegedly pointing a rifle out of a fifth floor window at a La Quinta Inn. Inside the room, Shaver, 26, who had been doing rum shots with a woman he had met earlier that day and showing off a pellet gun he used in his ja- in his pest control. Uh, he was he, the, the father of two. I mean, you see photos of this guy. Like, this guy is not, like, you wouldn't judge him as the dregs of society. Just, like, looks like your random, you know, middle-of-the-road, 26-year-old standard-issue white guy. I mean, there's nothing remarkable about him, but obviously he's a human being with was a father who is uh who was married mm-hmm. um don't know what he was doing with the woman but that's neither here nor there right um but his widow and parents have filed wrongful death lawsuits against the city of mesa so as they should so brailsford was on trial for shooting shaver and uh i have heard conflicting uh s- statements and i don't know if you can clear this up that i've read that the jury was not shown this video and I've read that uh, the jury was shown it. Have you? What if? Have, have you heard anything? Because I've read two conflicting different reports. I, uh, from everything I've read, the jury saw the video. They saw I, the. They, they I cannot it. imagine them not seeing the yeah, video. They saw the, everything I've heard. They said they saw it. Yeah. So we're gonna play some of the audio. And essentially, what happens is you you have the view down a scope. Uh, the the gun that you are looking off the scope of. Uh, according to the police report, was an AR-15 with the phrase, you're fucked, etched into the weapon. The police report also said the shots were fired so rapidly at a regular speed that one cannot count them, but he had five wounds. Uh, and Bra- Brailsford testified in court he believed Schaefer was reaching for a gun. The video is on a um, the side of, that, of, of an, a- an AR-15, but the AR-15 that shot him is a different AR-15 in the video, not shown in the video. This is a different AR-15. We're not watching down the actual murder weapon video. Oh, okay, so we're watching the other officer. Correct, the okay. officer that is, ta- uh, yeah. Okay, gotcha, okay. And so you're looking down this hallway, and it's just your standard-issue hotel here. And you see a woman walk out of the hotel room, and then you see a man walk out of the hotel room, and that's where we pick it up. Yeah, and the the the, before that video is that the cops are actually were sitting and they um, the cops are sitting outside this hotel room for like a minute, yelling instructions into this room. Right. So they have this hallway. They've had this. They've they've met in the lobby. They plan how they're going to come up here. They come up here to this room and they started barking instructions at this room. to have the female just come out, and when they and so this video starts with the female coming out first, and then another ma- and the man coming out. Now this is a five minute video. I'm not going to play the entire thing, but I want to give you a sense of what that hallway was like, so you can hear what the officers are saying, because I think that it shades what we're the information that we're going to give you after this. Uh, I will post the video in the links on this episode, so you can go and watch it for yourself. I will say that this is very, uh, it's tough for a lot of people to watch. Like, it's almost Nick Berg getting, I mean, the video that ruined me forever was watching Nick Berg have his head cut off in the mid-2000s in Iraq. And, like, from then on, I was, it was a life-changing video for me. And I think if uh, if you're a sensitive person, this is a very disturbing video. Uh, because you are seeing someone shot and killed in the video. But I, I would, I think these are the kinds of things that you need to be exposed to because this is real life. And you need to know the real life consequences of, you know, selling these sorts of weapons to police officers. Because this is what can happen. So, with that being said, here's the video. Failure for you to comprehend simple instructions. I'm going to go over some of them again, okay? Can you both hear and understand me? Yes. All right. If you make a mistake, another mistake, there is a very severe possibility you're go- both going to get shot. Do you understand that? Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. What the this is, shut up. I'm not here to be tactful or diplomatic with you. 
You listen, you obey. For one thing, did I tell you to move, young man? Did I tell you to put both your hands put both your hands on the top of your head and interlace your fingers? Take your feet and cross your left foot over your right foot. Who else is in the room? Nobody. Are you both drunk? No. no. They did have some drinks. You're not going to have any problems understanding anything that I tell you, right? Correct. Yes. All right. Can I go to my room? No, you're not going to do anything but come towards us. Okay. Young man, you are not to move. You're to put your eyes down and look down at the carpet. You're to keep your fingers interlaced behind your head. You're to keep your feet crossed. If you move, we're going to consider that a threat, and we are going to deal with it, and you may not survive it. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Young lady, shut up and listen. All right? You are to keep your feet crossed. Take both of your hands. Put them flat in front of you. You are to push yourself up to a kneeling position. Kneeling position. Now, put both your hands in the air. Okay, crawl towards us. I'm so sorry. You just heard him say, I'm so sorry. Uh, so it, it goes on, and they basically uh, have him put his hands. He follows every single instruction that they give him. He is currently flat with his head down, face on the ground, his fingers interlaced. He is uh, complying with all the demands. The woman walks towards the uh the officers we're yeah. going to fast forward to the video and keep in mind these are six police officers in a hallway with ar-15s right and he, it's based it's a kill box he it's is a kill box. he is a guy with basketball shorts on and uh w what eventually happens we're going to play through the disturbing part so just be warned if you want to fast forward about two minutes uh, if you don't want to hear it and what essentially happens is he is told to start crawling towards them on his knees and his basketball shorts fall down. He goes to pull them up, and that is when they fire. Legs crossed! Do you understand me? Yes, sir. You are to put both of your hands, palms down, straight out in front of you. Push yourself... Now let's note the escalation in their voice here's a guy who with the last time we heard the man's voice daniel shaver's voice he says i'm sorry well that's just unprofessional the last time that we heard daniel shaver's voice we heard him say i'm sorry clearly a hostile person right uh and once he is kind of goofy in the video he may he may or may not be drunk but he's definitely He's he's very insanely nervous and inebriated, and and he's at least had a drink. Mm -hmm. uh, and adrenaline's pumping. Adrenaline is pumping. He's, Six AR-15s are pointed at this guy. He's been told that he will be killed if he makes a mistake, mm -hmm. and uh, he is just petrified. He's terrified. I mean, you can you can see it in the video. So yeah. so Who right, wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be? Right. And so now they have him start crawling towards them. The woman has fall, gone behind the officers. He's now in a uh, – he's completely flat. His legs are flat. His arms are flat. Above him, he's now flat. Up, up to a kneeling position. I said, keep your legs crossed! Oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't say that the conversation. Keep Put your hands in the air! Hands up in the air! You do that again, we're shooting you. Do you understand? Please do not shoot me. I'm then listen to my instructions. I'm trying to do what you Don't talk. talk, listen. Hands straight up in the air. Do not put your hands down for any reason. You think you're going to fall, you better fall on your face. Your hands go back in the small of your back are down. We are going to shoot you. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Crawl towards me. Crawl towards me. <laughs> 
they then go into check the hotel room. They go into the wrong room, which is why the key doesn't work. Right. Which is why I say like tactical. No, like if they was someone actually was in that room waiting for them, they'd have been shot. Right. You know, like it, and it shows you how quickly they moved onto that room. So it was like, were they really afraid of someone else in that room? Right. Uh, so I want to I want to read a couple thoughts uh, first from a guy named Matt Walsh. And Matt Walsh is a guy that worked for The Blaze, uh, started at The Blaze. He now works for uh, The Daily Wire. He is a very conservative person. He is somebody that uh, on Twitter I have retweeted him a lot because he's been so right on about this. But this is a guy that is uh, an absolutely fearless conservative. Like he's, he, I wouldn't say he's libertarian, but he's very conservative. Like on abortion, he's very outspoken. Uh, and and he's just his nobody really seems to question his uh, conservativeness like Mark Levin level, uh, and Matt Walsh wrote a police uh, a piece called "Police Murdered This Unarmed Man," but the media doesn't care because he's white. Which, if it takes identity politics for Republicans to start caring about issues of justice, then maybe I'm okay with it. But uh, so this is what he this is his assessment of the video. Then comes the fatal moment as Schaefer as Shaver crawls awkwardly and wobbly, trying to keep this deadly game of Simon Says, his pants begin to fall down. He reaches to pull them up, and Brailsford immediately sprays him with bullets. Shaver followed his ridiculous instructions for five minutes and still wound up dead. Of course, Brailsford's defense was that Shaver reached for his waistband. Fine. But what was he worried about? That Shaver would pull a rifle from his basketball shorts? And even if he did have a gun, how was he going to pull it out and get off a shot from the crawling position? Mm -hmm. And what had Shaver done during this interaction to suggest at all that he was a threat? He was emphatically attempting to comply with every command. But why didn't Brailsford just walk over while the man was lying prostrate on the ground and cuff him? The officers on the scene had ample opportunity to detain Shaver without firing a shot. Instead, they chose to have him dance around like a trained monkey and the monkey died because he didn't want to dance with his shorts around his ankles. By the way, anyone who thinks of defending cops here, try this. Lie on the ground, interlace your fingers, put your hands out in front of you, cross your legs, and crawl with your hands in the air. Now imagine attempting the same act of contortion with police officers, pointing rifles at you, and a guy shouting that he'll kill you if you mess up. Now imagine all of that, but you've had a few beers. Do you think that you would have gotten out of this alive? So was Brailsford acting like law enforcement officer concerned with serving and protecting or was he behaving like a jumpy angry incompetent scared little bully on a power trip and then he goes on to talk about how the media hasn't covered this and well the answer seems obvious shaver was white had shaver been a different shade there would be riots in phoenix round the clock coverage on cnn daniel shaver would be the name as famous and as ubiquitous as michael brown and freddie gray but that's not how things have worked because the media isn't interested in exposing po police misconduct generally they're interested in exposing racially motivated, ma motivated police misconduct, even if they have to fabricate it out of thin air. That's really a shame because there are some police officers, not the majority, but some, who have no business wearing a badge. They lord over their power, over helpless, subservient civilians, and they relish the opportunity you, to use force. It would be good if the media was serious about exposing these cases when they happen, keeping the powers that be honest and holding them accountable for their behavior. A civilian shouldn't have to die because a cop was unsued for the job. This isn't an oops, we'll do better next time thing. Human life is sacred. And when it is taken wrongly, justice must be done. Sadly, very few people are interested in justice. Many people on one side are interested in advancing their racial narrative. So I, when a conservative writes those words, ooh, we may be at a tipping point. You know, mm -hmm. and and that's not one. This is this. These are the words of a national National Review writer David French, uh, former military, and, and uh, writes for the National Review, which is uh, uh, an establishment right, I would say, uh, publication that that has great writers. Essentially, what the Police told an innocent law-abiding intoxicated American was this, follow my highly specific, very strange instructions or die. There was no need to make him crawl. The police were in command of the situation. At no point is there a visible weapon. I've seen soldiers deal with Al-Qaeda terrorists with more professionalism and poise. When a man is prone, his hands are visible, and your gun is trained on him, he is in your power. 
Finally, I know that police have dangerous jobs, but they're not at war. As I noted above, it's infuriating to see civilian police exercise less discipline than I've seen from soldiers in infinitely more dangerous situations. Not one of the men I was deployed with would have handled a terrorist detention the way that these officers treated American citizens. So we have a Republican president. Now, normally what that, that means for conservative media is, all right, it's safe to go back. You don't have to oppose power anymore because Obama's not in office. We don't have to keep this game up. But with Trump in office, the conservative wing, the, le the more libertarian-leaning media, the more establishment media is, is saying there's a real problem with cops. Mm -hmm. They're saying things that libertarians have been saying for a long time, that people on the left have been saying that, you know, Radley Balco, if you go back in, in the feed and listen to the Rise of the Warrior Cop, a two-hour presentation he gave that we recorded, you hear a lot of these incidences happening and how they happen and why they happen, and that was posted in, like, 2014. Yep. You know, this is stuff that libertarians have been talking about. Like, the, you remember the L.A. cop that got burned alive in, in California because he was a rogue LAPD cop and mm -hmm. uh, Dorner? Yeah, yeah, Dorner. Dorner, I think, Christopher Dorner. You know, in 2013, you go back and listen to our show, we're saying, this is wrong. This guy deserved due process. Yep. This guy deserved a trial. He didn't deserve to be executed by fellow police officers. This mm -hmm. is a problem. Nobody was saying that kind of stuff. So it's great to finally have allies on the right as well as the left saying we've got a serious problem and the police departments across the country are violating the constitutional rights of all citizens. It's not just a black-white thing. It is a police versus the Constitution thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Wall's been saying that every time like I've come on here and talked about different situations, you know, I've, hopefully I've gotten that point across that it's not a race thing. Uh, this is just something uh, – it's just something that's going out there because the one, the laws are ridiculous now that they have that, that police or officers are having to enforce that places police officers in a dangerous situation. A lot of these drug laws that have them go after these drug, you know, enterprises that puts them in a dangerous situation for someone um, that they really shouldn't be in because a lot of the people who are doing the drugs are doing it to themselves. They're um, also the police officers aren't getting the training that they actually need to deal with people who won, who are actually inebriated, people who are dealing with people with mental issues. And if you want to know what I'm talking about, I was like, what do you mean? They talk, they deal with drunk people all the time, but yeah, but they don't deal with them with kid gloves. How many, how many nurses are in doctors or people who are having to deal with drunk people on a daily base, basis that are listening to the sound of my voice that has to deal with these people, but have never shot one. How many of you have had to deal with people with medical issues, but you didn't have to shoot one? You didn't have a gun to point at them. You didn't have the ability to call for backup. You didn't have, you know, BR glass and bulletproof vests. You were just alone working the third shift at a gas station. And someone came in and pointed a gun in your face and told you to follow his instructions. Yet that criminal at least had the uh, nicety not to shoot you in your face and just took, his, took what he wanted and left. You, you just keep going. Yeah, I'm okay. enjoying this. Yeah, it's yeah, it's the thing is, like, it's... The biggest issue with most people, what they have about with cops nowadays is that in America, in American society, it really does. And it clearly shows and when, you know, Chris will go in more in detail about this, that is there is more there's two sets of laws in this country. One's for regular people and the other one's for cops and politicians. They are governed by two different laws here in the state of Indiana. We had the uh, the David Bassard case, David Bassard. Uh, got drunk and ran over and he killed uh, two different people on a bicycle on, on, that was riding the motorcycles on uh, it was 56 cent old colony way I used to live right by there I remember then the day that that happened he was a police officer up to the time he retired it was really hard to get fire him he was drinking and driving they busted him for drinking and driving later on and it was is this whole like situation of wa watching him w the way he was treated with kid gloves the fact that you know he ran over hit somebody and killed them and was found intoxicated that man went went home he got ba and then he, then they took him and went and got bail no that that type of situation if any one of us even if you know we could you know it's it's an accident you know you don't get to go home you don't get to do these all the of these niceties yeah you can say like well he was a cop so they kind of gave him privilege but 
even that's wrong. Everyone should be equally treated in your laws that if you're supposed to espouse them. And then you've got the other case, the Walter Scott case, okay? That was the cop who shot the, uh, the man in the back. I'm removing race from it. It doesn't matter. This is two humans that this happened to. That cop that shot that man in the back, all right, from that traffic stop, got left out of the department. When he went to his case, when he went to the jail time, he still went to the plea I, and still said the mag- this supposed of cop magic words, I fear for my life. And he really sat there and thought that was going to get him off. And it didn't. It's, it's gonna, he's, he got indicted. He's going to face 20 years in prison. for, sh- But he shot a man in the back. And the only reason anyone knows the, know this man or the reason he's going down, like, uh, going down for, for murder is that because people videotaped you know the presence with cops you know and it's you know like well like the, this is we this from cop body cam yeah mm-hmm. and i would love to have this from 15 other angles in 4k and hd of other people videotaping that watching that intersection and that possibly would also helps maybe save that guy's life because those cops probably have been under um more cameras it was the whole situation was it's like i said i'm not in the military i and that's just ta- it, all of it looked all t- untactically sound, right? You know, they had they had a hallway with six AR fifteens, possibly. I, I doubt they all had twenty round uh, magazines. They you know, probably all had thirty. You uh, so it's one hundred and eighty bullets. And I'll pu- I'll they put this fire in the- downfield very quickly. I'll put this in the show notes. But you uh, you tagged a video called the Daniel Shaver shooting breakdown by to- donut operator. The donut operator. Who yeah. is the donut operator? The donut operator is just a it's a it's a cop. It, that he basically breaks down a lot of the police action shootings. It's a, I, or just different things that cop do. I watch a lot of different um, cop um, YouTube videos where they break different things down, and that's where because, like I said, like I don't hate cops. I hate assholes and right. people who ab- and people who abuse power. Then what but, are you doing here? Yeah, just like um, <laughs> uh, Officer Dominique Irizo, um, his videos like that. What he says, like. Uh, when he talks about like the way that uh, he tries to teach people how to do the traffic stop, you have to understand. Yes, you're in the right. You can do all these different things. You have these rules to do all this stuff with it, but you have to understand the situation that you're putting someone else in, right? If you want them to make you human, this is the cop talking to the another tyrannic another officer to do a traffic stop is going like, if you want the person you're stopping to treat you like a human, to see you as a human and not just some jerk in a uniform, mm-hmm. treat them with the same hum- humanity, treat them with the same respect. Yeah. When you go to that, uh, when you talk about when you go to the car and you ask for identification, you ask for registration and the proof of insurance, tell them how long this is going to take. Tell them. Hey, this is going to be it. I'm going to do this. This is going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Yeah. So they know, but they're sitting there. Bring back the humanity of the traffic stop, or be humanity, and you don't know what else is anyone else is on, and under situational awareness. He, he went. He's got entire video series talking about just bringing like the humanity back to cops. Yeah, because it's it's like an online internet fight. Yeah. You know where where once you re- remove somebody's humanity. Mm-hmm. If you see it's it's why there's so much road rage. His uh, researchers think that. People don't see a person in the car. They see a car. Yeah. And so they take out their anger and frustration about something on an inanimate object, not realizing there's a person in that car. And so that's why you have so much road rage is that people are reacting to something that's inanimate. And we turn people that we fight with on the Internet or we turn cops or we turn commies or Nazis or whomever. We take, we take these big blocks of identity – and then we start railing against them without ever stopping to think that, oh, there's people that believe that stuff, you know, and maybe I should persuade. Like libertarianism, you, you are a racing force mm-hmm. from your toolkit, and therefore you must use persuasion to get what you want out of society and to build a society mm-hmm. and to persuade people of what you'd like to have happen. And therefore it's impossible – to strip people of humanity. That's why if you see a libertarian figure railing against the left or the right or commies or Nazis or SJWs or this or that, like they don't understand libertarianism. Mm-hmm. Because once you start segmenting people into these big blocks of identity, then you start stripping people of their individuality. Mm-hmm. And individualism and individual rights are the very core of – it's the – First principle of libertarianism is that every person is an individual. They are deserving of dignity and respect, 
and that they're not uh, you have no moral authority or ethical reason to use force against those people. So so I would just caution you that anytime you start to get into these discussions and you find yourself saying, well, the left and mm -hmm. I do it all the time and you hear us do it on the program it's and have it. And of course, because, you know, you can stereotype, you can, there are identities, you know, there are different traits between Harry and I based on his blackness and my whiteness. There are experiences that are different. There are, but there are also experiences that Harry has as a gamer and me as a non-gamer. Those are two pieces of identity. And if I'm just sitting here saying all video gamers are, are lazy and stupid and awful, well, then Harry's not going to sit there and respond to his friend. He's going to say, well, everybody who thinks that video gamers are stupid and lazy, they're actually Nazis. And then you just start building, and that's how we get to this place in society where police officers feel that they have the right to defend themselves to the point that they will, like, that person doesn't mean anything to this guy. Daniel Shaver means nothing to this guy. If he, if he, because he may now, he may he may after he killed him and mm -hmm. had to go to trial and had to face the humanity of Daniel Shaver, but when a police officer has, you know, you're fucked written on his automatic weapon or semi-automatic weapon. I think it was an automatic one, actually. No, no, it was an AR-15, so it was semi-automatic. Yeah. yeah. And it was his dust cover. He had his like, dust cover. He, he doesn't give a shit about the people. He's not protecting and serving. Mm-hmm. He is fighting, and we are not – you do not fight American citizens. W you know, when you study the first uh, – I almost said the Ten Commandments. When you study the first – when you study the Bill of Rights, you know, the third is not quartering soldiers in your home. And we, we don't – we're not forced to do that, but we are forced to now quarter troops in our communities, right, you know? Yeah. And so – we're getting to a place where you really have local communities, especially in black areas of your community, treating cops like an occupying force. A lot of them have tanks. And they have tanks. Lawrence, like, P Lawrence Police Department has a freaking tank. Keene Police Department has a tank. Right. Um, Lawrence, yeah. Lawrence is like there's no there's no reason for the Lawrence Police Department to have a tank. None. Like Lawrence, to None. give you an idea, is like a town of – 30,000 in the middle of Indianapolis? Like, Not in the middle. We're at the corner between McCordsville and Fortville. Right. So we're on the way to Pendleton. Okay. You're between it's, nothingness and corn and the city of Indianapolis, uh -huh. and there's like 40, 50,000 people maybe. Yep. Like, now, granted, Lawrence got some bad areas, where, but it's like this one little itty bitty pocket where the trailer parks are. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, they, and trust me, they're, they're trailers. You don't need a tank for a trailer. The great musician Henry Lee Summer got arrested for meth in one of these trailer oh, yeah. parks. I mean, and you didn't it, need a tank to stop Henry. Yeah, and they and like the thing, one thing that they did buy that made freaking sense when they were going through Lawrence was buying SUVs. They got rid of all these high speed cars with the ram buttons on the front of them. Like, where did you get that? You're barely going to get up to eighty right. here in Lawrence. Yeah. Maybe if it's pedaling pike, you can get over a hundred. Maybe. Mm -hmm. But these SUVs and stuff that's four-wheel drive that you can drive in the snow, okay, that makes sense. This kind of yeah. makes sense. But, but yeah. Um, Final but, thoughts. Let's. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the thing is, like, with the, um, with the case, right? The, like I said, uh, with the guy, when he went to, when he went to prison, oh, no, when he went for the, for the, for the case, right? Mm -hmm. He still said he feared for his life, even though, you know, he's five other his buddies there with guns you know if anyone else like let's say like we knew like a domestic violence situation was having up there and you know let's say we grabbed i grabbed five other my buddies we sat there with ar-15s to go rescue somebody from a domestic violence situation we all would have been in jail mm -hmm. for murder okay <laughs> yeah that's the problem, okay? Now, it's like, granted, it's like, cops have to get there, and they have to deal with these different people, but we just want them to go against the same law someone else does because, just like I said, the uh, cops deal with crappy people, work third shift at a gas station. You deal with crappy people, and mm -hmm. you can't shoot a dang one of them, and you don't have backup, and you're going to probably work 12 hours a day, $12 an hour, barely anything. Cops make hazard pay. Cops have backup. Cops have all these different things. Yeah. Um, 
they're they're given a special class in society right and and um and they can retire in 20 years they um have uh you know they can go get overtime they can do all this different moonlighting stuff a lot of different districts allow them to keep their cars which i understand a lot of it a lot of cops do a lot of good for the community okay they police taking their cops uh, take their car squad cars home that does a lot of uh you know, like that's help prevent like a lot of crime in different um, mm -hmm. neighborhoods, and I get a lot of the good, a lot of good cops do, mm -hmm. and I'm not. Uh, hopefully, the cops that are listening to this or anyone listening to this that I'm not taking any of that away. Right. What I'm taking away is the asshole that believes you don't know where you know. Like I'm having to deal with these streets and out here on the streets with these people, and I'm like, so does everyone else. Everyone else is out here. Yeah. The firefighters out there, the EMS workers out there, um, the nurses are out there. Um, the people working at the clerks at gas station, the tow tuck driver, okay, a tow tuck driver, a tro uh, a tow tuck, a tow truck, truck driver. driver. All right, okay, out there, All okay. Right. They pick up people who they don't know from freaking at them, okay. Right. They pull their car up on the side of the road. They're in the, you know, they got cars whizzing by at eighty miles per hour to hook up a car to take someone. And a lot of the time, a lot of the guys, sure, you can ride in the cab in this car. Mm -hmm. They don't know who this person is. This person could have just stole this car, right? Used it to get the other tow truck driver here, just steal his tow truck. Right. Or steal parts from him or rob this other guy. Right. He doesn't know this guy from Adam, but yeah, here, go jump in my or truck. Steal his kidney. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's all that different stuff there. The other thing with the. Um, um, Let's see, let's see, got that, 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 that. Trying, trying <laughs> you got the mental day. checklist. Um, back to, um, I want to do go over uh, the operator donut. He does do a good job of breaking the thing down. And he also talks about why the, he also asks, tries to ask us why the cops don't treat this like a regular uh, felony traffic stop where they would just have the person do a 360 turnaround. He, if you go on, on his um, YouTube video, he does a, he does show a video of officers doing just that, a felony traffic stop where right. they have guns on them. They would just keep standing, okay? And when they would do a 360 and just walk backwards and then have a cop take one down and then have the other one do it. Yeah. It seems when watching the video, it's like, wow, that would have saved someone's life. Mm -hmm. That and the cops, are, and then when they were doing the video, that that sound, they sound forceful. They were trying to get someone to follow their orders, but it wasn't that aggression of you're going to, you know, you're going to die. I am in control of this situation. Yeah, tight. It, it was just very, it was very unsettling. And this is, I think, Oath Keepers is such a great organization. That's why Cop Block, Cop Block devolved and was a really worthwhile organization because Cop Block was an organization started in Keene, I believe, mm -hmm. where people in Keene, you know, you had libertarians who were constitutionalists all the way to anarcho-capitalists mm -hmm. and had a lot of problems with the police. And uh, instead of turning them into the the enemy and, bull, you know, and this avatar, what they started to do is they started to reach out to individual cops and say, hey, can we grab coffee? And yep. they started to sit down with police officers and explain who they were, what they were doing, why they believe what they believe. Here's why we're not bad dudes. Here's here's what we believe. The cops started asking questions. And a lot of police officers in New Hampshire started retiring from the force because they no longer could do their job because it went against their moral beliefs. Because after a period of two to three years, they started to say, what I'm doing isn't what the job of a police officer of observe of of protecting and observing people's rights and preserving them. I'm not doing that. So I'm not doing this anymore. And 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 you know that one on one evangelism, essentially, for lack of a better term, w was something that was very effective in New Hampshire in converting a lot of people. And cop blocks started to take that model and spread it out to a lot of different communities. But then you had people jump into it, and and our former co-host Maya was one of these people where it's like it's antagonism. Mm -hmm. Like, well, they're stealing our rights. We have the right to kill cops because they're they're violating my nap, so I can violate theirs by killing them. And it's like, well, you're you're the problem. You're the problem. Like, you're just as much of a problem, if not more, because at least they have the force of law and the force of incentives and losing their paycheck to behave you have none of that you're just like a psychopath you know and so cop block devolved into something that that it was filming cops and and antagonizing them and that's why it disappeared but yeah i mean 
it, it, it really is reach out to your local police department and say, hey, I'm a libertarian. I want to have a discussion about what it's really like to be a police officer mm-hmm. and report back to us because I'd love to hear what conversations you have in your local community. Cop Block is still there. It's a shell of his former self. It mm-hmm. was sold off to some unknown person. It was an anonymous sell off through. And some of the stuff happens is what happens when uh, a lot of the different people that record the basically the moral fiber of Cop Block, they got burnt out. And the people that took the reins after that, you know, it did kind of burn a lot of people even chat mine i was like wow i you know i almost feel uh, you know like crap like you know because it has it, been several different times like you see a lot of their videos and then you're like there used to be able to post like full raw footage you can see it unedited which every video is edited that you see on a show technically this video that we showed here it was edited it was edited down to five minutes mm-hmm. there's a lot more footage that you can get on this thing like the planning the pre-up in the lobby the after shooting the failed breach of the hotel room which is hilarious by the way and like I said, anyone who said, like what I said, that's not tactical, get on Twitch, watch some 14-year-olds play Rainbow Six Siege, and you see what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, you know, you could have gave some 14-year-olds, like, that's not how you clear a hallway. That's not how you clear a room. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. Uh, love to hear your thoughts. Please send in an email, editor at We Are Libertarians, or get in the Facebook group or the Twitch. Join us at WeAreLibertarians.com, and then you can uh, start start uh, talking with us. We love We love hearing from you guys. I uh, had a lot of great conversations with a lot of listeners today as I was catching up on some uh, emails and messages. So uh, love to hear what you guys have to th- have to say. Um, all right. So the New York Times, uh, you know, Sunday is the day to check the major newspapers because that's the day. That's the blockbuster day that uh, – <laughs> Uh, if you comment on one of our Trello cards while we're doing the show, I will see the message and you will make me laugh mid thought. Oh, my bad. You, you commented on, we're going to talk on the bonus episode this week about the, uh, 10 things, uh, an intersectional feminist will say on a first date. Uh, it's a, and Carrie just wrote, this is cancer and he's right. It is, which is what we're going to talk about in the bonus show, which you can get by subscribing on Patreon for $5 or up a month. Uh, So the New York Times, like I was saying, Sunday is the big blockbuster day when they release their big reports. And the New York Times has interviewed over 60 advisors, associates, friends, and members of Congress trying to get an idea of what Donald Trump's day looks like as president. Now, this is not an attack on Donald Trump, and this was a pretty fair and balanced piece, I think. I think it was very, uh, you know, middle of the road. This is a piece that within the first year or two of every president you see the New York Times and all of these newspapers do, which is – how is the new administration operating? How is the president spending his day really? Um, Harry, I don't know if you read this. Did you read this? Mm-mm, okay. This one. this one was you added after I stopped, like when I started dealing with Gunther. Gotcha. So what would you say Donald Trump's, if you were to guess what Donald Trump's day looks like, what would you guess? I assume, um, now I didn't read this article, but this is, so this is just natural assumption. Uh-huh. I'm guessing he starts his day at 3 a.m. or to, which some people like to believe it's 3 a.m., which in reality, what is that, like 9 mm-hmm. a.m. because, of, you know, Greenwich time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, back to the time. Yes, yeah, they brought it back to the time. I know, especially. yes. Um, <laughs> Move along. <laughs> he gets up at 9 a.m., eats a nice big hearty breakfast, you know, probably some leftover steak that he doesn't even heat up. 17 McMuffins. Yeah, No, no, not McMuffins, <laughs> just heat it up steak in the microwave with some ketchup on it and starts tweeting and then probably turns on like um like four screens of all just television shows because he, he clearly doesn't read or watch it um he just watches he doesn't po- he's t- he's a boomer so he doesn't listen to podcasts right he just watches these shows and he and then you know and then he just yells at people that's what i think that's his day Pretty close. <laughs> Very close. Would I get wrong the yelling part? No, no, you pretty much got all of it right. Just times. Uh, that's yeah. really what we need to figu- figure in here. Uh, so this was by Maggie Haberman, Glenn Thrush, and Peter Baker. All, ex- all excellent reporters. Glenn Thrush is being investigated for, I don't know, hitting some, on some women at a bar. Um, the, the whole sexual harassment thing, which we're going to talk about in the bonus episode. <sighs> Um, so around 5.30 each morning, President Trump wakes up and tunes into the television in the White House master bedroom. He flips to CNN for news, moves to Fox and Friends for comfort and messaging ideas, and sometimes watches Morning Joe because friends suspect it fires him up for the day. 
Energized, infuriated, often a gumbo of both, Trump grabs his iPhone. Sometimes he tweets while propped up on his pillow, according to aides. Other times he tweets from the den next door, watching another television. Less frequently, he makes his way up the hall to the treaty room, sometimes dressed for the day, sometimes still in his night clothes, where he begins his official and unofficial calls. Um, for other presidents, every day is a test of how to lead a country, not just a faction. Balancing and balancing competing interests for Mr. Trump every day is an hour by hour battle for self preservation. He still re relitigates last year's election, convinced that the investigation uh, about Russia is interfering, is a plot to delegitimize him, which it is, which I will get to in the next segment. Before taking office, Mr. Trump told top aides to think of each presidential day as an episode in a television show in which he vanquishes rivals. People close to him estimate that Mr. Trump spends at least four hours a day and sometimes as much as twice as that in front of a television, which this is the part that got headlines and everything, but it's probably, I mean, it's consequential, but it's not, you know, the only thing in this that is interesting. Uh, sometimes with the volume muted, marinating in the no holds bar war of cable news and eager to fire back. Let me just say <laughs> that if you're watching television news, for the bulk of your news diet, you are having your intelligence insulted. You are being propagandized willingly. You are, if you're watching only CNN, you're watching only Fox News, or even if you're watching Fox News and CNN thinking you're balanced, you're being propagandized. You need to read, you need to listen to podcasts, you need to have a healthy variety. It's like Fox and Friends and Anderson Cooper are like, ice cream and cake but you need to have vegetables which is why you read the intercept <laughs> or the new york times or or the daily caller or just listen daily to all Coach. on repeat exactly that's, all that's really need. all you need that's all you honestly like you get a really healthy view of the news if you listen to us mm -hmm. i do my, i try my best through our social media channels our groups our website our soon to be email newsletter to give you what you really need to know without all the bull um axios does a great job too uh the hill as well uh, so his staff tries to wrangle him. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. No. His approach got him to the White House, Mr. Trump reason. So it must be the right one that uh, he should live in volatile territory. He's more unpopular than anybody of ever, but yet he dominates the landscape like no other. After months of legislative failures, Trump is on the verge of finally cutting taxes, reversing the health care program. Much of what he has promised remains undone. He has made progress in the goal of rolling back business and environmental regulations, the growing economy he, he inherited. Not true. <laughs> I mean, it was getting better, but Trump in the White House has brought predictability to the stock markets, which is why the stock market has gone up under Donald Trump. Because when you have somebody who, who leans free market, we're not saying Donald Trump is a free marketeer by any stretch of the imagination. It's certainly not by our definition, but compared to Barack Obama, basically a socialist donald okay. trump on the economy for especially wall street investors is a much uh better choice in their mind than hillary clinton yeah and the simple fact that uh, there's a lot of people that will stop the government from doing anything exactly so no new laws is great for wall street yes uh stock markets have soared to record heights his partial travel ban is finally taking effect after winning court fights um you know, Jared Kushner, his son-in-law and senior advisor, has told associates that Trump is deeply set in his ways at 71 and is never going to change. Rather, he predicted Trump would bend and possibly break the office to his will. That has proved half true. Mr. Trump so far has arguably wrestled the presidency to a draw, their words. But um, John Kelly, they go on to talk about how John Kelly works a 14-hour day. When Reince Priebus was the chief of staff, uh, it was a, ro a revolving door. And when New York Times reporters met him in April, more than 20 people wandered through the office. Uh, let's see, uh, didn't say how long this was, but uh, more than 20 people wandered in and out, including Pence and Priebus. Uh, the door to the Oval Office is supposed to close now. Kelly is trying to reduce the amount of free time that Trump has. So he's focused on the job as opposed to watching TV. So he speeds up the meetings, increases the amount of meetings, uh, and uh, Kelly has a hard time, like Priebus, getting him to the office by 9 or 9.30. Um, so they have a ton of different meetings. Uh, beyond Mr. Kelly and Kirshner, they often include H.R. McMaster, the National Security Advisor, Ivanka Trump, 
Hope Hicks, the communications director, Robert Porter, the staff secretary, and Kellyanne Conway, the president's counselor. Uh, not in the legal sense, but just in the you know, advice sense. Um, Mr. Trump enjoyed complete control and made concessions when he hired Kelly. And uh, he calls Kelly a dozen times a day, even to four or five times during dinner or a golf outing to ask his schedule about Trump's schedule, seek advice. And he really sees Kelly, it says, as an equal. So Kelly is somebody that he's really bouncing a lot off of. Uh, Kelly is a former uh, military man. Uh, this article really gets into his background a little bit. Um, and Trump, at times, despite Kelly kind of controlling that flow of information, Kelly came in and stopped that revolving door. The Oval Office door remains closed. Only Kelly gets – gets, uh, he controls the schedule with an iron fist, basically. And that's why I think you've started to see more discipline coming out of the White House. Um, but – over Thanksgiving, Mar-a-Lago, his friends and family at parties will oftentimes slip him clippings. They'll show up and say, uh, hey, have you heard about this? Um, so they, <laughs> they write, people inside, inside and outside Washington have been convinced there's a strategy behind Trump's actions, especially with the tweeting, but there's seldom a plan apart from preemption, self-defense, and obsession and impulse, which seems about right. Uh, they say that he will often ask for advice on tweets. He thought that the uh, calling it a witch hunt was a slam dunk, and all of his, his tweet <laughs> advisors. Like, this guy has tweet advisors. I mean, I wish I, sh I should have tweet advisors. You um, got mittens. I got mittens, that's true. I mean, I tweeted about my lactose intolerance yesterday. Somebody probably should have stopped me. Um, but and, and he kind of tried to reel it in until all the Manafort stuff really started to get to him. And they talk ma mainly about how Trump just, like, starts to boil over, starts to get pissed. And then he just, like, I've got to get this out there. I've got to set the record straight. Um, once he posts controversial messages, Trump advisors sometimes decide not to raise them with him. One advisor said that aides to the president needed to stay positive and look for silver linings where they could. Uh, and... They don't let the tweets dominate their day. The ammunition for his Twitter war is television. No one touches the remote control except Trump and support staff. That's the rule. There's a 60-inch uh, screen in meetings in the dining room that may be muted, but he keeps an eye on the headlines, and he checks on his quote-unquote super TiVo that records all the cable news. Watching cable news, he shares his thoughts with anyone in the room, even household staff he summons via a button for lunch, or one of the dozen Diet Cokes he consumes every day. And he was pissed on a trip recently when he was in uh. Asia because all they had was CNN in the Philippines, and he was pissed. Um, uh, Mr. Trump, you gotta, can't drink the Diet Coke. That's for tame. <laughs> Listen here, Harry. That's for tame inside the Diet Coke. <laughs> Harry, uh, bring me my Coke. Uh, <laughs> Harry, get the door. Uh, to an extent that would stun outsiders, Mr. Trump is the most talked about human on the planet, yet he relishes, he delights seeing his name in the headline. He's on a quest to see it there. One former top advisor said Mr. Trump grew uncomfortable after two or three days of peace and could not handle watching the news without seeing himself on it. Uh, during the morning, he monitors Fox and Friends live or through a transcription service, much in the way commodities traders might keep tabs on market futures to predict the direction of their day. AIDS monitor, Fox and Friends. Uh, if someone on the show says something memorable and Mr. Trump does not immediately tweet about it, the president's staff knows he may be saving Fox News for later viewing on his recorder and instead watching MSNBC or CNN Live, meaning he is likely to be in a bad mood the rest of the day. Um, few get to see other parts and pieces. In private moments with the families of appointees in the Oval Office, the president engages with children in a softer tone than he takes in public, yet he specifically asked that the children of the White House press corps be invited in as they visited on Halloween. He does, yet he does little to promote that side, says longtime friends, because it cracks the veneer of strength that he relishes. Um, so <laughs> they go, <laughs> only occasionally does Mr. Trump let that let slip his mask of unreflective invincibility. During a meeting with Republican senators, he had discussed in emotional terms the opioid crisis and the dangers of addiction recounting his brother's struggle with alcohol. According to a senator and an aide, the president then looked around the room and asked puckishly, aren't you glad I don't drink? Mm. <laughs> mm. Were you about to stop me? No, I just was shocked. Like, So he's um, kind of like a ridiculous Captain uh, Picard. Oh, oh, 
Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we get to it. Oh, uh, because it's it's pretty funny about how he thought the job was going to operate, and that's kind of the, what the rest of this is about. Oh, no. um, he is, in a lot of ways, kind of like a big kid. Uh, he's very excited that he can invite anyone to the White House he wants. He can get any food he wants. He's enjoying being like a little Ayatollah. I mean, Come he really on, is. Noosh. Yeah. You can invite Tech Nugent to the White House. <laughs> I think he's been there, hasn't Has he? he? I think so. Did, he, did Donald Trump were getting it? See, see, I swear there was a photo. Because did he get disarmed? That's all I want to know. Oh, yeah. Did yeah. They di- <laughs> yeah. I think that early on there was, Nuge was there with like Sarah Palin and it was like a oh, killer's, was. it was a killer's row of, there's like a photo of him and a bunch of like, yeah. like Kid Rock and like awesome. hilarious <laughs> conservatives. Who else was in the photo? Yeah. Chris, Chris Rock. Not, um, not Chris Rock, yeah. Kid Rock. <laughs> yeah, it's Kid Rock, Sarah Palin, and Ted Nugent. <laughs> That's awesome. Posing in front of a picture of Hillary Clinton together. Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> very he funny. He is Andrew Jackson. This is awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's something else. So uh, Mr. Trump's difficult adjustment to the presidency close to him is rooted in an unrealistic expectation of its powers – which he assumed to be more akin to the popular image of imperial command than the sloppy reality of having to coexist with two other branches of government. This is the guy that the founders wrote the the three branches of government for. Okay, if you don't think that the founding fathers weren't the smartest individuals to ever commingle on this planet at one time, like they foresaw Donald Trump 200 and... 50 years later or whatever it's been. But the thing um, is, uh, he's just more of like, he's just more outshowing with it. Obama's probably was the same way. Of, yeah. Just more reserved. Right. Bush, definitely. Bush, yeah. Second Bush. Uh, yeah, they all relish this this power. Bill Clinton, definitely. Oh, yeah. Bill Clinton was renting rooms out. Yeah. Allegedly. Uh, his vision of executive leadership was shaped close to home by experiences with the Democratic clubhouse politicians as a young developer in New York. One figure stands out to Mr. Trump, an unnamed party boss, his friends assume he is referring to legendary Brooklyn fixer Meade Esposito, whom he referred to as keeping a baseball bat under his desk to enforce his power. To that, to the advisor who recounted it, the story revealed what Mr. Trump expected being president like, ruling by fiat, exacting tribute, and cutting backroom deals. But while he is unlikely to change who he is on a fundamental level, advisors say they saw a novice who was gradually learning the presidency – uh, it does not work that way. He is he is coming to realize they need to woo, not whack, leaders of his own party to get things done. During and this may be a telling moment of when this relationship went wrong. During his early months in office, he barked commands at senators, which did not go over well. I work. I don't work for you, Mr. President. Bob Corker said. Uh, Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, during a presentation, bristled when Trump cut in during one of his presentations in the Oval Office, and McConnell said. Don't interrupt me. And the president got the message. Um, he stopped feuding with them and now talks to them on almost a daily. He talks to McConnell on almost a daily basis. Um, Pelosi said that uh, at first there was a threat of being an imposter that may have been in his mind. He's overcome that by now. The bigger problem, the thing people need to understand, is that he was utterly unprepared for this. It would be like you or me going into a room and being asked to perform brain surgery. When you have a lack of knowledge as great as his, it can be bewildering. Now, I know we all hate Nancy Pelosi, but that's probably a pretty fair estimation considering we all thought that as well. Like anybody who follows politics, you knew he didn't know what he was talking about. He was completely unprepared for this job. Oh, yeah. But technically, any, everyone is really unprepared for uh, being the president of the United States. Yeah. Um, one other essential part of Kelly's job is keeping information from flowing to him. Um, they, <laughs> Kelly, uh, calls garbage peddled to him by outsiders is a priority for him. Uh, even after a year of official briefings and access to the best minds of the federal government, Trump is skeptical of anything that does not come from inside his bubble. Um, and, uh, he really loves verbal briefings. Other aides bemoan his tenuous grasp of facts, Jack, Hold Jack up. rabbit attention span, Hold propensity up. for conspiracy theories. They just... Did they just go after him for like not liking ver- he he likes verbal stuff instead of people like writing an email? It was more of a fact. Uh, okay, I, it, I thought they were like more yeah. of an attack at it because like still to this day the FBI doesn't do recordings for like their interviews. Yeah, so like Steve so Mnuchin, Se- Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin was basically saying it's a good thing that he's skeptical of of everything. Uh, I see a lot of similarities between the way he ran the campaign and the way he's president. 
He really loves verbal briefings. He's not one to consume volumes of books or briefings. Other aides bemoan his tenuous grasp of facts, jackrabbit attention span, and propensity for conspiracy theories. Mr. Kelly has, to has told people he pushed out advisors like Bannon and Sebastian Gorka, who he believed advanced information to rile Trump up or create internal conflict, but Mr. Trump still controls his own guest list. And then they go on to tell a crazy story about Fox News host Jeanine Pirro, who basically, like, like was like, you need to get tough on Mr. Mueller. And Trump was eventually like, Roy Cohn was my lawyer. I know what I'm doing. Roy Cohn was uh, a McCarthy-era fixer who mentored Trump. Uh, legendary figure. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, in, in some ways he sounds like a libertarian. He's skeptical of anything that comes before him, and uh, he likes conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Galt. Yeah, basically Chris Galt is president. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so... He reads a lot of newspapers, uh, but Bannon has told people that he reads to reinforce. Um, so he uh, can invite anybody he wants, and, and here's what he likes for dinner. Uh, he likes a well-done steak, salad slathered with Roquefort dressing and bacon crumbles, terrines of gravy, and massive slices of dessert with extra ice cream. Um, so he loves to give tours of the White House, uh, he likes to uh, show them the bathroom. He likes to show off all the bathrooms for some reason. Yeah, love um, bathrooms. He he loves gossiping. Uh, he loves this. This made me laugh out loud. Uh, there is part of me that loves this guy. Uh, he he invited four Democratic lawmakers and asked them who was going to run. Uh, he's talking to congressmen, and he goes, "Who's running against me in 2020? Crooked Hillary, Pocahontas." <laughs> and he goes, Bernie Sanders of Vermont, he would definitely run, even if he's in a wheelchair, making a scrunched up body of a man in a wheelchair. <laughs> oh, right. He's something else. Uh, hates Mark Cuban. Uh, sad that Tom Brady is no longer his friend. Um, even when Mr. Trump is in a lighthearted mood, hints of anxiety waft over the table like steam over a teacup. September, he met with evangelicals to reassure them that he would still pursue their agenda despite flirtation with Democrats. The Christians know all the things I'm doing for them, right? Uh, you know, reporting, praising his positions on issues like abortion and Planned Parenthood, uh, by the way, has signed bills that three times. So all you Roy, Mo Roy Moore supporters out there, three times he has signed a spending bill to keep the government running that funds Planned Parenthood. Uh, when the guests depart, he goes back to watching TV. He loves Fox News, especially Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram, and sometimes hate watches CNN to get worked up, especially Don Lemon. Me too, bro. Um, talks to a lot of his old advisors and uh, basically he's kind of settled down on the Russia stuff, but uh, gets about five hours, six hours of sleep a night, and then wakes up the next day and does it all again. So really interesting look. It's kind of exactly how you thought he was uh, acting as president. <laughs> Just watching a lot of TV and and things, so yeah. It's, 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 one of the things that I'm I'm sure is getting him worked up is the fake news. That's what he tweets about the most. He loves picking the fight, f picking a fight with the media, and the media is giving him lots of fodder lately. Uh, I want to take a moment though before we jump into the fake news to talk about the Russia investigation because that's where a lot of it stems from. And we finally this week got some information on Sunday from NBC News as to what exactly the Russia investigation is looking for, because there's not been a real um, clarity. I mean, we talked last week about how there's no clarity as to what they're looking for. And it turns out what they're looking for is what did the president know and when the, did the president know him? They're, rip, they're, they're bringing out the old favorite tropes. Uh, and basically, Mueller is looking at that 18-day period between when senior officials in the White House, his counsel, uh, were all told that Flynn had lied to the FBI and the vice president. And then 18 days later, when he got uh, let go, did the president obstruct justice? OK, so that's not what the investigation was started over, which we'll get to. But that's what the focus is now. Now, you'll remember Watergate, uh, you know, Whitewater essentially was started. Uh, Ken Starr started investigating Whitewater mm -hmm. and ended up prosecuting him for perjuring over Lewinsky. So th that's how these things operate. So 
essentially the some of the timeline and i know that a lot of this is confusing with flynn and i don't think we did a great job um talking through the dates but essentially uh december 29th of 2016 uh kislyak the russian ambassador and flynn had a conversation and it was being recorded by a, a presumably the fbi and the the uh national security agency and uh, Flynn said he did not talk to Kislyak about Russian sanctions, and it turns out he did. And so then he goes in and talks to uh, the FBI on January 24th, and that's when he says, no, I did not talk to them about this. And, you know, Kislyak basically said, yeah, we did talk about sanctions, uh, or there's recordings or something. I don't know how they know he lied, but essentially they know he lied to the FBI on January 24th. And on January 26th, uh, then Sally Yates, who was uh, – it, it was a contentious fight for Attorney General uh, Jeff Sessions to get in place. So Sally Yates was held over uh, after Loretta Lynch stepped down, was the uh, Attorney General. She met with Don McGahn, the president's White House counsel, and told him two days after Flynn lied to the FBI that he did indeed lie to the FBI. Um, so – Yates has testified to Congress that she informed McGahn on January 26th that Flynn had not been truthful in statements to senior members of the Trump team, including Pence. When she said she did not discuss U.S. sanctions with Russian Ambassador Kislyak, Yates said Flynn was susceptible to blackmail by Russians because he had lied about the contents of the phone call with Kislyak. So essentially, Yates is saying to the Trump administration, we know for a fact that your national security advisor just lied to the FBI and the Russians know that he lied, and so now he is susceptible to blackmail. You need to do something about this guy. And uh, immediately after the Department of Justify Justice notified the White House counsel of the situation, the White House counsel briefed the president and a small group of senior advisors. Spicer, Sean Spicer told reporters on February 14th, two former federal prosecutors said that McGahn would have immediately gone to Flynn and asked him whether he had lied to the FBI. So... Um, now what they're looking at is what happened in those 18 days between them finding out that he lied to Pence, that he lied to the FBI and him getting fired. Why wouldn't you fire him immediately? And the Washington Post knew about it, uh, in early February of that year. So days, the Washington days after the Washington Post got two sources saying that Flynn had lied. And once it came out in the Post, Flynn shifted his story, according to White House officials. He lied to Pence on February 9th, and then on February 13th, Trump fired Flynn. And <laughs> here's the funny part of this. Yates says this on January 26th to about Flynn, and then herself gets fired on January 30th, citing her refusal to enforce the uh, travel ban. Um he appears – now Mueller appears to be interested in whether Trump directed him to lie to senior officials, including Pence or the FBI, and if so, why, the sources said. I have to be honest. I don't know why Trump would say that. Um, he you, – you're kind of jumping to a lot of different conclusions. Like yeah. you're saying like, okay, well, now here's what the Russia, Russia investigation is about. It's about obstruction of justice, and it hinges on you now determining – if the president of the United States said to Flynn, you must lie to senior officials, to the press, to the Russians, to the FBI, to the vice president, and you must not tell anyone that you lied and you must obfuscate. And like, I just have a hard time believing that Donald Trump is that dumb. Right. Yeah. Considering like everything else he's very tight lip about or runs things by lawyers first or always worried about different things. That makes no sense. Especially that he knows there is no conclude uh, conclusion. <laughs> Yeah. You all right? You going to make it? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I just died of air on air. But uh, he, he he knows he didn't do anything wrong. Right. So why would I? I don't, I don't, that's so, what I don't understand. Right, so about it makes no sense. It, and this article reads like there's something that should be off some awful geo site, you know, conspiracy theory blog. Yeah. You know, that's what this whole, that whole article sounded like. Yeah. I got this point here and this point here and this. See, it all coincidence right here. Right. Yeah, it's it, what it all comes down to is Flynn now, and it's just like, why did he lie? What did he, you know, what was the point of lying? It, so there's something in Flynn's background that some something just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, I like 
I look at all of this information and I just go, well, the weird thing here is Flynn. It is not Trump. It's not the deep state. Mm -hmm. It's not the Democrats. It's not Mueller, who is the deep state. Like, it's just Flynn lying. So what's the missing piece that we don't have here that is like, here's a guy who served honorably for 30 years in the military who this program praised when he was appointed. Right. You read his book that he wrote about f fighting terrorism. It's great. Mm -hmm. Like, what? I don't get it. Yeah, he had a misstep and then lied about it. That's about it. It's it's really confusing. Yeah. And, and he lied multiple times. It's not like he stuck to the story. But, mm -hmm. hell, I mean, the his boss did it. <laughs> Roy Moore's doing it. Why not him? Um, so, yeah, this this whole Russia investigation is – I think you're going to really see a turning point here with the Russia investigation because this isn't what it was supposed to do. And now what you're seeing in a lot of all this is uh, the, the Mueller team starting to get picked apart, and uh, some of this is pretty crazy. Uh, you're, you had Fox News put out last night um, on December 11th, 2017, this report where – Wife of demoted DOJ official worked for firm behind anti-Trump dossier. James Rosen of Fox News reports, a senior Justice Department official who was the fourth in the Justice Department d was demoted last week for concealing his meetings with the men behind the anti-Trump dossier, the Steele dossier. And he had even closer ties to Fusion GPS, the firm responsible for the incendiary document, than have been disclosed. Uh, they found out his wife worked for Fusion GPS. Now, Fusion GPS, you'll remember, is the uh, the anti-Trump Republicans, the Hillary Clinton campaign, the Democratic National Committee, and reporters hired Fusion GPS, this research firm that is made up of former D.C. reporters that started to put together opposition research about Trump together. And this is the origin of the Russia scandal, this document. OK, this is where this is the you remember the salacious part was Trump, you know, watching the strippers pee on each other. Mm -hmm. But there was also Russian ties that when he was over in Russia during the Miss America pageant, that they had some compromising information on Trump, not only the stripper stuff, but maybe some financial stuff. Um, and this is this document was put together in mid 2016. And by the campaign, this is where all the chatter from the political class in the swamp basically starts to leak out this document was very public and if you actually read it it's not set up like a dossier and it was put together by former fbi officials who we will who we will get into detail with now so it turns out that a senior department of justice official a person who was fourth highest his wife worked for fusion gps and they all worked together with uh, Rod Rosenstein and uh, the Andrew McCabe at one point in the FBI. So it's a very cozy relationship. And I think you're going to have a very hard time looking at the Russia investigation the same, because now where we're at in all of this is that you have the, we all kind of knew that the left and the deep state had started this. And we knew that it started with the Steele dossier, but now we're figuring out where all that came from. And we're getting it from the House Intelligence Committee that's looking into Uranium One, Fusion GPS, the Clinton Foundation. And so as that investigation gets started under Chairman Nunez, uh, which presumably this is where uh, James Rosen got this information, you're going to start seeing an erosion of the Mueller investigation and all of the evidence that led to the Russia investigation. And that's why you're seeing, in my opinion, a pivot from the left to attacking Donald Trump on the sexual misconduct stuff. So Christian Gillibrand coming out and saying, you know, he needs to resign. And now senators are stepping up and saying he needs to resign because they can tell the Russia thing's not working anymore. So yeah. uh, let's see. So contacted by Fox News, investigators for the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence uh, confirmed that Nellie Orr, the wife of the demoted official Bruce Orr, worked for the oppo research firm last year. The precise nature of Orr's duty, including whether she worked on the dossier, remains unclear. Um, they, uh, they served as the basis for the Justice Department and the FBI to abstain. Th this Fusion GPS document dossier served as the basis for the Justice Department, whose number four was married to the Fusion GPS lady, and the FBI, who worked who 
Number two was Rosenstein and McCabe, who worked with the Oars, <laughs> <laughs> and the FBI to obtain, obtain FISA surveillance last year on the Trump campaign advisor named Carter Page. Um, until December 6th, when Fox News began making inquiries, Bruce Orr held two titles at DOJ. He remains the director of Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, but his other job is far more senior. He was associate deputy attorney general, a post that gave him an office door for, down from a deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, and then Andrew McCabe is number two at the FBI. Um, the day before Fox News gathered the report, uh, Orr held secret meetings last year with the founder of Fusion GPS, Glenn Simpson, with Christopher Steele, the former British spy who compiled the dossier. The Justice Department stripped Orr of his deputy title and ousted him from his fourth floor office at the DOJ. Um, the dossier was provided to the FBI in July 2016, shortly before then candidate Donald Trump accepted the Republican nomination. Um, a review of open source material showed that Mrs. Orr was described as a Russian expert as, at the Wilson Center. And essentially, they all kind of worked together at the this Russian task force that basically took on Russian mobs. So now Victor Davis Hanson has a great article in the National Review called One Mueller Investigation Coincidence Too Many, which I will link. And basically, the he he. he says, listen, this Mueller investigation was started to do what they're all started to do, which was a dragnet to try and com catch crimes, and it goes to the Soviet line of show me the man and I'll find you the crime. Mm -hmm. And uh, the investigation is venturing well beyond the original mandate of rooting out Russian collusion. Indeed, the word collusion is now rarely invoked at all. It's now all about obstruction. So then he goes on to talk about the team. So here's some of the coincidences with the Mueller investigation. The people working on the Russian investigation – uh, so you have you you have all the stuff that we've been talking to you about. There's this weird position of Comey subordinate and deputy director of the FBI, Andrew McCabe. He ran the Washington, D.C. office that was involved in the Clinton email investigation. Uh, McCabe didn't recuse himself from the email investigation until one week before the presidential election, even though months earlier his wife, Jill McCabe, has announced her Democratic campaign for state Senate seat in Virginia – and had received a huge donation of more than $675,000 from the political organizations of Terry McAuliffe, a longtime Clinton supporter and friend. Hmm, that's weird. But then it was announced that at least six of Mueller's staff, of 15 lawyers, who had previously had donated to Democrats and Hillary Clinton's campaign, hmm. and now they're all investigating Donald Trump. But then you get to Peter Strzok, who we talked about a lot last week. He's the FBI investigator assigned to the Mueller investigation of Russian collusion. Strzok and Lisa Page, a consulting FBI lawyer, were, were for some reason relieved from the investigation of Trump in summer of 2017. They refused to explain why, but then we figure out it's because they were having an affair and exchanging some 10,000 text messages of which some were adamantly anti-Trump and pro-Clinton. But then Strzok apparently was also responsible for changing the wording in the official FBI report on the Clinton affair, where we talked last week about how he basically changed the word grossly negligent, which has legal implications, to extremely careless, which is just meh. Yeah. Then we learned that Andrew Weissman, who was another veteran prosecutor assigned to his team, praised Sally Yates who we just talked about, for breaking her oath of office and refusing to carry out President Trump's immigration order. order. I'm so proud, he emailed Yates on the day she publicly defied the president, and in awe, thank you so much. All right, so then we get to another attorney. Janine Rhee was at one time the personal attorney of Ben Rhodes, the Obama Deputy National Security Advisor, who is often mentioned as instrumental in making last-minute Obama administrative state appointments to thwart the incoming Trump administration. Rhee also provided legal counsel to the Clinton Foundation and was a generous donor to Hillary. And then again, we have Bruce Orr, connected with various ongoing investigations and helped set up the anti-Trump dossier. And his wife, Nellie Orr, worked for the actual source of the dossier. And then we learned about the strange career odyssey of yet another person named Aaron Zelby. 
Uh, he was known as his right-hand man. He once served as Mueller's chief of staff while employed at the FBI and was uh, an, you know, in both the counterterrorism division in the FBI and the N national security division at the Department of Justice. He, uh, let's see, he, Zelby, as late as 2015, represented one Justin Cooper. The latter was the IT staffer who set up Hillary Clinton's likely illegal and unsecure server at her home who purportedly smashed Clinton's various Blackberries with hammers in fear that they would be subpoena. Zelby had come into contact once earlier with congressional investigators when he was legal counsel for Cooper, and yet Zelby now is on Mueller's investigation team. That's a lot. Right? Yeah. I know, I've, I've done a lot of talking, but there's a lot here. Yeah. There's a lot. <laughs> that's, that's some crazy shit, man. I mean, it, are... It, like you now, st you're now starting to see like all those deep state ties come out, right? And it's just, uh, like the weird thing is like when this whole collusion and thing was supposed to go start, and you're like, they're not going to find anything. You figured it'd probably be like a week or two, yada yada yada. And now here we are, a year, almost a year later. Mm -hmm. They still didn't find anything, but they're finding out the other side. They're finding out all these different ties. These yeah, different, these weird different um uh, like a connection that everybody has you know and it's you know and, and everyone knew that we believe that these connections to have but it's nice seeing the proof in the pudding though yeah i mean it, and there's a reporting on it too yeah of uh, you know it's um it's kind of like um it's if i don't know what what, you, what any of you guys did during the uh, whole uh gamergate saga but if you go back and read the FBI fi files with, during the whole Gamergate thing, mm -hmm. it showed all kinds of conclusions. A lot of different things like the Gamergaters were trying to talk about that there was going on between the media. It was all let go in like the FBI files. Just, so that's why kind of Gamergate kind of like went the way of the, you know, everyone stopped talking about it because once the FBI dossier came out, it kind of just like, no, what are you talking about? That's not what the FBI said. The right. FBI investigated everything, you know. And they, one person they did find out was a 14-year-old in Ohio, and they went and saw him. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you're going to start seeing calls for investigations into the investigators, and there's a district uh, court judge in charge of this that is uh, a badass that, uh, I, you know, it's so funny when, like, Dick Morris has this new podcast or this new Facebook program. Uh, he's working with Facebook to do this show called Deep Six, The Deep State, and it's so funny because... Dick Morris was the deep state. He worked in the White House for Clinton. And it's hilarious to see, like, these fringe conservative guys start to latch on to the alt-right, libertarian-leaning movement because they're alt -right's irrelevant. alt not libertarian-leaning. The alt-right's not even right. The alt-right is left. They're I'm, a bunch I, of leftist socialists. Alt-right and libertarian-leaning. No, I don't want an ampersand. I don't want a comma. <laughs> the alt-right are lefties. They're socialists, they're socialists in their message, they're socialists in their collectivism. The alt-right are a bunch of lefties. Uh, no. All right. No. They're over there. Harry has Harry has made a fatwa. No, listen to, like, listen to them. Right? I know, no, no, no. It's, 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 like, you listen to any of these boomers who are pro more, and it's all about their snowflake feelings. Mm -hmm. Like, alt-right people, like, the, all these people who got involved in the right movement since Trump, or were Tea Party Republicans, it's all about their feels. They're no better than snowflakes. You're totally right. Tea Party, they can come on the right. We'll take them. Um, no, no we'll, you don't. No, 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 no. We'll take the Tea uh -uh. Party. No, I'll take them. We'll take them. No, 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 no. If you, but, you don't get the alt-right, I don't get the, you, you don't get the Tea Party if I don't get the alt-right. <laughs> I don't want the alt-right. I don't want the Tea Party. Not in the that's libertarian fine. movement. That's fine. Cool. I, I'm fine right, losing at right. this point. I, uh, it was, you're just not winning with the alt right. That's not a winning, you know. Right. I believe their message is not winning. The people that kind of believe that different stuff, those people you can interact with, talk to, and try to hopefully get them to to fix them. But that message, that ideology, no, nah, that's 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 socialism in, in white hoods. Well, okay? <laughs> yeah. Let's. I mean, let's hear some of these people. We'll talk about a little bit about Roy Moore. Uh, because the polls are closed, uh, so yeah, I've been like scouring the news. Here in, any time, <laughs> any time we should start. It's about nine o'clock Eastern, eight o'clock Central, which Alabama times on Central. So what's that UTC? I don't know. My prediction is that Roy Moore is going to win with a healthy margin. Uh, Fifty-five percent of the people in a CNN exit poll said that they didn't care about the accusations against Roy Moore, and that kind of seals it. But Vice did a couple of really inter like Vice is. Uh, 
a love hate relationship when it comes to vice for libertarians, but nobody does better on the ground reporting that gives you a sense of what's going on in a, in a war zone in Alabama, wherever. Uh, I always check in on vice. I really like their HBO stuff. And Frank Luntz, conservative pollster who is not a fan of Roy Moore, actually went down with Vice and held a focus group. And these – I'm not going to play this whole thing. You can go watch it in the show notes. But you actually, like, listen to these people, and th this is – there's so much cognitive dissonance for those of us who, like, try to figure out the truth and figure out and, – and be intellectually consistent. But – this is not – we're not the majority. <laughs> you know, this is the majority. These are the Roy Moore voters down in Alabama. Are you all Christians here? Yes. yes. Is Roy Moore a good Christian? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely? Yes. Without any doubt whatsoever? I do, well, not, I do not know the name. That's not what I could know necessarily. They're, well, let me not. ask you this. Nobody's perfect. Please explain nobody's perfect when you look at the things that – he has been accused of. Accused That's, is not found guilty. I want to know. Just because I don't go to church every time the doors are open doesn't mean I don't believe. And God doesn't expect us to be perfect, but he does expect us to try and repent of our sins. He's not my choice. I'm not voting for him because I like him. I'm voting for him because I don't want Doug Jones. But Roy Moore is entitled to the presumption of innocence in the law and in the Bible, just like anybody else should be. There are only accusations. There have been no charges filed. All you have is a group of women that have come forward How and many? said... How many? Seven. More. Now there's really three. Higher. How many women have to come forward before you say, wait a minute... Where there's smoke, there's fire. It's a matter of all it's a legitimacy, not just how many. Exactly. How many are actually not being paid or being coerced to do this? How many of them do you think are being paid? All of them. All of them? All of them. All of them. By show of hands, how many of you think all the women are being paid? Seriously. To me, there are only two women that maybe have a smoking gun, but, you know, the women's their reputations were questionable at the time. Is this how you want to be treated as a woman if something were to happen to you? Do you want to be dismissed that way? Better have proof. You know, you know it doesn't sound like it went beyond the still clothes on. It doesn't sound like it went beyond anything. And that as soon as the girl said she wasn't comfortable, he took her home. Uh, I guess my question is, you blame her. She's 14. I, I'm not blaming her. I'm blaming both of them. So I didn't say that I thought he was without sin. It's possible he did it, but it's possible that he could be forgiven for... I don't think he raped her. And, and let's be real. He... It was a different world. 40 years ago in Alabama, uh, people could get married yeah. at 13 and 14 years old. My grandmother at 13 was married. At 15, had two children and a husband and a job. If Roy Moore was guilty, if, if he was at the mall hitting on this 14-year-old, 40 years ago in Alabama, there's a lot of mamas and daddies that'd be thrilled that their 14-year-old was getting hit on by a district attorney. We ought to go with a conservative. We ought to go with somebody that we know is going to vote conservative. And that's what I'm looking for. Junior. Roy Moore is not a miserable man. This man has more integrity than you can find in the entire Congress right now. Don't fall for the George Soros assassination plan. The truth well, will come out. These women are all going to be proven, just like the 16 that went against President Trump, just right before the election. What about the yes. women who went against I mean, the, some of those. The accusers of Clinton, everybody knows he's a womanizer. Well, people think the same thing about Roy Moore. With Bill Clinton, they went to the courthouse and they filed papers. They didn't wait 40 years to do it. That's a huge difference than just... Uh, I mean, not in all the cases. They sued him when he, be when he was running for president. Yeah, so true. now let's, let's play the, and this is real short, let's play the uh, Democratic side. Uh, and this is a piece from Vice basically talking about the failure of uh, Doug Jones and why the black community is really not going to go out and vote for Doug Jones. And if Doug Jones doesn't mobilize a lot of black Democrats to go out and vote tonight, he's not going to win. Jones is doing your traditional black voter outreach, visiting some African-American churches and neighborhoods, appearing with prominent community leaders like Randall Woodfin, Birmingham's popular new mayor. Y'all give it up for Doug Jones. 
And Randall Woodfin is somebody that you're going to see a lot of. He's the next Cory Booker, in my opinion. He's the young Birmingham mayor. He's under 30, I think, and he's a really dynamic guy. But that's the crux of Jones's problem. Democrats have done this type of campaigning for decades. And many black voters don't know what makes Doug Jones different from the generation of Democrats that preceded him. Are you going to vote for Doug Jones or Roy Moore? Who, oh, me? Yeah. Man, listen, I love to vote and I vote. Anybody I ain't going to vote for neither one. I don't know no Doug Jones. That man ain't came right here and spoke to the people. We the people. See, we on that old 1960 where you got to get out and vote. We have done that, man. Ain't no, ain't no changes. When the last time you voted, man? Man, I just voted for the last, for the mayor election, sir. Why? Why? Respond to issues that affect their lives. So you just can't walk up to your house and say, Oh, are you going to vote for Doug Jones? Who in the heck is Doug Jones? Of course, I know who Doug Jones is. I know that he prosecuted the Klansmen for killing those poor precious girls. But that's not enough to make people want to vote for him. What are you going to do for me now? So uh, I think that just, to me, it, it, it's it's a deep red state. Doug Jones hasn't done enough. He, he was always the candidate that was going to lose to the Republican. You know, he he was a sacrificial lamb candidate who just kind of got, you know, <laughs> blessed with the opportunity to get run against Roy Moore. I would say blessed. Eh. And so he's been. What happened to those ladies? That's always a blessing. And Roy Moore has been somebody that is very well known, very controversial, but somebody who for a lot of Alabamans, a lot of those baby boomers that you just saw who are voters, you saw people who, you know, they're they they're Roy Moore fans. Those He's the Ten Commandment guy. He's. The guy who's taking on the establishment in, in uh, Birmingham. He's taking on the establishment in Washington. You know, those people are reading Conservative Treehouse and listening to and reading Breitbart and listening to Sean Hannity. Mm -hmm. And that is where they get their news. It is you you really have the Trump effect. You, you The polls are all worthless. There was no no poll in any kind of runoff election like this or special election is ever worth a damn. But I think polling permanently is broken, especially with a candidate like Roy Moore. You have the same Trump effect where people are not going to admit that they're voting for Trump. Uh, so I think Roy Moore takes it uh, takes it tonight and probably by five to ten points. And you're going to see Roy Moore every <laughs> – if you're working for the Democratic uh, Congressional uh, – the Senate Re-Election Committee, you're rolling C-SPAN all day long. You're having travelers follow your candidates – like here in Indiana, we have a very contested race. It's a very, you know, this is a red state mm -hmm. with a with a likable blue senator, and you you Donnelly has Donnelly could uh, have a tough time facing an a uh, you know one of the two congressmen that will probably win in either Rakita or uh, who's the other Republican running? Um, Andrew Horning. Andrew Horning, apparently. <laughs> okay, we'll see if he makes the primary. He's oh, you can't win as a Libertarian Party person. It's like well. You you have to get 500 signatures in every district. Let's see if you can do that. Um, uh, if he does the niece effect, <laughs> just <away>. shit posts. <laughs> uh, no, going around the truck stops with uh, tall boys. Todd Rakita, former Secretary of State, uh, somebody who's a congressperson from the west side of the state. Luke Messer from the east side of the state, former state GOP executive director. And these congressmen are going to be formidable candidate candidates and. Candidates cannabises and uh you're gonna have a, he's gonna have a tough time so if he can get a tracker to catch a video of him next to roy moore and then just loop that on television in the last five days they're gonna do that mm -hmm. and so roy moore is going to become the gift that keeps on giving because this guy's a nut i mean he he doesn't yeah. like he said on a radio show cnn basically on the k files found like where he was saying uh i don't uh, necessarily think that uh we need any of the amendments after the 10th Amendment. They've caused a lot of problems. Well, that's the women's right to vote. That's Harry's freedom. That's uh, like... Oh, not my freedom. I was already free. My friend was already free. But, right. but that women's right to vote? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean... I'm just joking, ladies. He's just one of those dudes who's just going to be a, a constant lightning rod. So the gift that keeps on giving, I, th I think he will handily sew it up. But I wanted to play you those two pieces because... I think what you heard in those is the the average voter on the right and the left. I think you heard people who just kind of want to have their biases reinforced. And I think we're just at a really dangerous place in America where 
one group of people have one set of facts and another group of people have another set of facts. And then there's everybody in the middle who has their own set of facts. And it's just whatever. It's like postmodernism that we all worried about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, a young little church baby going to church, worrying about postmodernism and how it's going to erode the church. Well, it's (laughs) it got to the the republic much quicker uh, than the church. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing is also shows you the um, one pro- problem with the republic is one, you've got to have this person represent half the state. So there's a lot of different voices mm-hmm. out there, right? So that's hence that's your other problem. Two, two party system. Look at all these people trying to choose between these different people. I'm sure a lot of those black people in those in those um, barber shops would love to have another option, you know, more option that they feel more comfortable right. with. And I'm sure the libertarian po- libertarians they would love to have the ballot access to be to to have these people to keep telling them, your only choice is you know Ron, uh, is um, uh, Roy Moore and um, you know, Doug Jones. It's like what? Why isn't anyone talking about Bishop? No mm-hmm. one. No, no, I didn't even mention him. There's like even like if you get on CNN, write in. There's a five percent write in. Right. Who are they writing in? Yeah. <laughs> right. There's only there's only two people that was registered to for a write in candidate. The um, Republican that um, had the. Um, that lost to Roy Moore and the Libertarian Party. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's it. So they had. Ron Bishop was the Libertarian candidate. And I can't uh, remember the Luther the, Strange. Luther Strange. Is it, yeah. Sorry. So and, and and for all the talk that you're going to hear, a wet dream on CNN is uh, well, will the Senate vote to remove Roy Moore? No, they're not going to. That is a that is a media fantasy mm-hmm. for ratings because the truth is is that if they removed him from the senate the republican governor could re- appoint somebody to the office like they appointed luther strange they then have to have a special election mm-hmm. and nothing would stop would legally stop roy moore from running in that special election again and we do this all over again and the republicans nationally do not want this hassle again so right. I, I largely yes I do. And then, but the, but if they did that, the Republicans can use that in in tw- uh, throughout twenty eighteen to twenty twenty. Is yeah. that the Democratic Party is now like a party of you know like of no? They're the party of that just trying to stop Trump. They don't want to get anything done. They just want to yeah. have fighting. Yeah, and so you're de- you're not going to see that. Win, yeah. You're going to see, you know, this was the will of the Alabama people. We need to respect the will of the Alabama people, and that will be the end of it. Donald Trump will gloat. And Donald Trump really did need this vote because, you know, like, Betsy DeVos would not have been confirmed had you not had a reliable vote in there. You, you from a Donald Trump's perspective, if you don't have this vote in the Senate, I think you finally kind of realize this. Like you leave yourself open to the John McCain's and the Bob Corkers who have a grudge Mm -hmm. all the way to the Rand Paul's who have ideological differences and the Susan Collins and the Murkowski's who just are wishy-washy trying to maintain whatever. I don't know what they're doing. Yeah. But like what's the other problem is the problem is people being up there that that vote party line. Yeah. Like if you could like if you could get a Democrat from your own state, they're like, no, you know, they will choose different parties. It will choose different bills to vote on. But if they're going to vote party line each yeah. time you have to get a member of your party regardless of what they believe in yeah so he needed the reliable republican vote ironically to counter against his own party because like i said he you know mccain shuttled health care uh pence had to break the tie on betsy devos so this was a this was a really essential vote for president trump to have and that's why you saw him him eventually campaign for him and being too cute by half going to pensacola which is right on the alabama border pensacola florida you know, to, to get Alabama people in there, but never to have to take the photo with him, uh, you know. But <clears throat> nobody nobody who pays attention, uh, but there's no photo of him, and he will do his best to never see Roy Moore in person. Um, he, one other little thing about all this, uh, Donald Trump basically came out and uh, took a swipe at Christian Gillibrand. Christian Gillibrand is an opportunist politician, and so whenever you see her take a hard stance on something, the polling told her it was a good time, and there, Donald Trump basically came out and said, lightweight Senator Christian Gillibrand, a total flunky for Chuck Schumer, and someone who would come to my office begging for campaign contributions not so long ago and would do anything for them, is now in the ring fighting against Trump, very disloyal to Bill and Crooked, used. Uh, she then responded, it was the sexist smear attempting to silence my voice, and I will not be silenced on this issue. Neither will the women who stood up to the president yesterday. Um, you know, you cannot silence me or the millions of women who got off the sidelines to speak about the unfitness of your office. 
Uh, Pocahontas came out and said, <laughs> uh, I, I know she deserves more respect than that, but it's funny to me. Does she? Uh, no. She's a socialist. Are you really trying to bully, intimidate, and slut shame Senator Gillibrand? Do you know why you're picking a fight with who you're picking a fight with? Good luck, Donald Trump. Uh, hashtag she persisted. So Warren and Gillibrand are both trying to run for 2020. They're both trying to pick up the Hillary Clinton mantle. Uh, Gillibrand literally took up the Senate seat left by Hillary Clinton when she ran in 2008. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is always talked about for 2020 as though she's some sort of hope. Um, the so I I didn't quite uh you see everybody on TV news dancing around this and nobody in like these kind of articles where I got this was NBC like nobody's explaining that but I had someone actually tweet at me on Twitter last night uh, when I basically tweeted out like Gillibrand is basically the type of person that if you see her taking a hard stance it's politically a good issue for her and her political career and uh, Trumpet basically tweeted back at me saying, well, she only got that seat because she offered sexual favors to Governor David Patterson, remember the blind governor yeah. in New York, for that seat. So, And he was from New York, and he's a, a Trump fan. And so that's that must be the conspiracy theory, and that, that that's like everybody knows in like the Trump conspiracy circles that mm -hmm. I don't know because I don't follow that stuff as close. So that's what he was referring to is he's basically saying you fucked your way into office and that's why they're saying this is slut shaming. This is, you know, but Trump, Trump is not going down for sexual harassment. Yeah. Like yeah, the cases that. are not as strong as like the Clinton stuff, like the Lewinsky, Lewinsky, you had all the rumors, but then Lewinsky got taped by Linda Tripp mm -hmm. talking about the semen on the blue dress and then it was off to the races because right. they had hard proof. Yeah, so hard evidence. Yeah. So we're. You're not going to that, see him go down for that. Hard evidence that people actually went to the cops and filled out police reports. And right. now, granted, like, you're trying to say, like, th they're going to do this, but they're going to do this to a sitting president. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you saw in the vote last week when Al Green put forth the impeachment vote, a lot of Democrats said, no way. Nope. Because they recognize that if you use this against Trump, it will be used against them. And the political will is just not there. It isn't right. there. And you heard those Trump voters say, you know, these aren't valid. No conservatives going to vote for it. Independents are not there yet. Mm -hmm. And liberals, hardcore liberals, so you've got 30 percent of the nation that would like to see him impeached. But that's not enough for political will to take, take place. Yeah. And with Trump being president, you have a chance in 2020. With Mike Pence being president in 2020, even though Trump got impeached, you right. don't have a chance. Yep. You don't have a chance. Not a chance in hell. Yep. You know, so, because they, they've got a chance. With Trump, they got a chance that maybe he gets primary, maybe he steps down because he's tired, doesn't want to do it anymore. Yeah. But Pence? Oh, you ain't got no chance in hell. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. Like, they just haven't learned their lesson from 2016. Like, I think as libertarians, we kind of learned our lesson. And, like, there are some libertarians who are like, let's be outrageous. And then there are others who are like, oh, there's a whole group of people out there we could fight for that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem like the left or the media have learned their lesson at all. They're so hopeful about obstruction and breathlessly, like, Harry, you, you – put in the Trello, I'll let you kind of give the details on The Intercept, basically Glenn Greenwald writing, you know, the, the title yeah. of this article is, the U.S. media suffered its most humiliating debacle in ages, now refuses all transparency over what happened, and I mean, the media just basically goes out there and continues to make the same mistakes over and over and over, and the left makes the same mistakes over and over and over, and all you do is, every time you punch at him, you, he just grows stronger. Yes. So Stronger? Each time, each coming back. Yeah. Um, the I don't really like reading articles, so I'm just going to paraphrase. Like, I, go mm, for it. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> um, this one is like a. The, uh, from I the, highlighted all the parts that need paraphrasing. Essentially, I I highlighted the facts for us. So, I just feel like I've talked a lot. So I want you to kind of give the details because this Glenn, 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 this thing, basically to put it into perspective, like CNN handed him a gift, and the media just keeps handing him a gift, and there's no transparency there. None, none, none whatsoever. All right, so um, the U.S. media suffered its most uh, humiliating debacle in ages and now refuses all transparency over what happened. Um, this is basically what happened out on fr uh, was it fr uh, Friday, and it was like watching this go over 
over the whole weekend and just watching like them just like, okay, maybe they're finally going to touch them because the intercept hit them early about this on Saturday. And he was like, okay, they're going to do something. They're going to step it back, but it never really freaking happened. So the spectacle, uh, the spectacle began Friday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, if you believe in stupid time zones. Oh, my God. Right, you, you've already gotten hate mail on the time zone thing. Can you stop, okay, please? Okay, I'm sorry. I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> but it just, it just GMT is the only time. Uh, when the most trusted name in news spent 12 straight minutes on an air on flamboyant hyping an exclusive bombshell report. So they basically kept going like, we've got this bombshells coming up after the break. Keep listening. Here it right. comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Yeah, that they supposedly actually had basically had con- the con- concrete evidence all these different people coming out and talking about conclusion with uh, russia and trump multiple Mo- news outlets had multiple, multiple. sources saying and that they, they had email evidence and they had it they, they yeah. that donald trump jr had gotten email keys had gotten security keys from wikileaks mm-hmm. to uh yeah that he got the keys early that they got the email because he got because the, the russians and wikileaks got him the dnc emails early before anyone else and this is what they went after and they kept going and hyping this thing up and showing it out there and they basically spiked the football and the whole thing and it wasn't until about two hours later that uh, other news agencies started to look at this thing and realizing that the dates were wrong <laughs> it was december 4th in the report by uh, mano raju the congressional reporter at cnn And it was actually December 14th. Right. And so the rest of the world had it. What you had was a reporter getting the word from sources, basically a congressional staffer or -hmm. a congressperson saying, I've seen this email Mm -hmm. that Donald Trump Jr. got the WikiLeaks goods uh, 10 days before everybody else did. Did you see this? And because it came from, you're seeing a lot of leaks on these emails from the Democratic House Intelligence investigations Mm -hmm. just like the earlier leak was the republicans investigations and uh the mueller team that's where you got those leaks on the other side you're you're seeing these leaks yeah and so they found this email this conclusive email and this hyperventilating staffer ran over to cnn and said uh guess what we've got him we've got him you gotta report this get it out there now now, get it out now 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 now, now. And they didn't even see the email. And right. then when they actually got their hands on the email, mm-hmm. they saw it was 10 days later. And then everybody was like, oh. Oh, yeah. Worse than Joe Behar on The View. And yeah. It, yeah. Because, and, like, yeah. And, you and watch then, it, and, and it's the, just, like, breathless. Yeah. And the, re- and, and the retraction was, like, a, they, they kind of meant, oh, you want it back. Yeah, I want it back now. Give it. I'm sorry. Give I don't me, like. Give me, my, give me my binky. I don't do good sitting there reading articles in in. No, I don't want to read the article, yeah, because you're doing a great job. But, yeah, I mean, it was basically yeah, clear they just uh, yeah, didn't and, have it. And then the retraction. The retraction of it was, like, what is it, like a, it was a two, not even a two-minute statement. I don't want to even give them, it wasn't even a two-minute statement. It, it was just like, we were wrong to report on this, da, 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 yeah. and moved on. But this is something they were hyping all morning long for, f- like, four-plus hours, talking about this is how it is, this is just what we've got, and then kind of gave it, like, a one-minute retraction. And I think Greenwald had a couple of good points in this. Yeah, points and jabs uh, at it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to begin with, it's hard to overstate how far, fast, and wide this false story uh, traveled. Democratic Party pundits, operatives, journalists with huge social media platforms predictably jumped on the story immediately, announcing that it proved collusion between Trump and Russia through WikiLeaks. One tweet from Ted Lieu is still up there. Uh, you know, they go on to kind of outline all these different sources that had it, had it up there. The entire revelation was based on an email that CNN strongly implied it had exclusively attained and in, in its possession from someone from Michael J. Erickson. And it turned out that it was all publicly available already. Um, it's hard to quantify how many people were deceived, filled with false news and propaganda by the CNN Russians, by the CNN story. Thanks to Democratic loyal journalists and operatives who decree every Trump Russia claim to be true. Without seeing any evidence, it's certainly safe to say that many hundreds of thousands of people, almost certainly millions, were exposed to these false claims. Surely anyone who has any minimal concerns about journalistic accuracy, which would presumably include all the people who have spent the last year lamenting fake news, propaganda, Twitter bots, and the like, would demand an accounting as to how major U.S. media outlet would let this happen and fill people's brains with totally false news. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how a good journalist... Uh, actually exposes their source, like the Washington Post did with the Project Veritas people last week. They came out and they said, you know what? We were lied to by these people. We exposed them. Mm -hmm. And that's not what happened here. And what you're getting from CNN is a lot of uh, obfuscating statements from PR executives and lawyers. So 
it's really important that if you if you're really into this Russian story, if you're on the left and you think this is a, a scandal, then you've really got to care a lot about fake news. And so you have to start looking at your own side. And the thing about all these these scandals, this the the these breathless, uh, sorry about that type situations, mm -hmm. it always hurts the right. And that's why you get the right starting to believe that a hand a, a signed yearbook yes one part of it was fake but the other part of it was accurate a, a postcard from high school or a christmas card like hard evidence from 1979 isn't even valid in their mind because you keep screwing up and instead of handling it with transparency mm -hmm. you just shut it down yeah with everything, yeah. Yeah, and it's always a low side or going against the um, narrative. They'll shut it down or they bring up ridiculous different statements that will just hurt any other message that's not the mainstream what they're going off of that day. And it's, yeah. it's ridiculous. And, yeah, and you can almost – you can give them the, like, that's why when they're like, okay, I understand why they're doing that now. You know, when they you watch an advice video, it's like, okay, I can see what they're saying. Yeah, I can. See, yeah, you've like I see where they're coming from. That is that they're not they're not denying any of it. They see it all. They seen all the evidence, but they're like, man, do I actually see this in front of a you know court? Right. You know, they're just not judge credible. On this. I, don't I don't like the government, but the government should verify this for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't like. Yeah, I don't like the government, but I'm gonna need them to verify this thing. <laughs> right, and and so you get the point. Yeah, you you see where they're coming from, and so you see. So what you have is a Bannon comes along, who's a master propagandist. Mm -hmm who says, who takes that little grain of truth and then blows it into an us versus them mentality for political purposes. Which is very good. He's, that. he's very good at it. He got, mm -hmm. he, he's, he didn't get the president elected. Roger Stone had way more to do with it than Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon glommed on at the end, but Steve Bannon's still very good. But he's very good at coming in at the last minute and then taking credit for the whole thing mm -hmm. uh, when other people are doing all the work. Um, he, Steve Bannon, let me be honest, is actually a huge piece of shit. Like, I really just think he's a huge piece of shit, and I think he is a terrible person, and, uh, I, I hope his heart explodes any moment. Um, uh, all right, but, all right. Uh, it's, now it's gonna be awkward at the patriarchy meeting on Saturday. <laughs> sorry. You know at the, at the <laughs> schlubby, fat, white guy meeting that yeah, we all have. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's some, and just, uh, so he, <laughs> Greenwald lists some of the things that, uh, Inf incredibly inflammatory claims that traveled all over the internet before having to be corrected, oh, walked yeah, back, yeah. or retracted, often long after the initial false claims spread, where the corrections receive only a tiny fraction of the attention. Um, and, like, this is just recent stuff. Russia hacked into the U.S. electric grid to deprive Americans of heat during the winter, Washington Post. Not true. Not true. Yeah. An anonymous group, prop or not, documented how major U.S. P political sites are criminal agents. Published by the Washington Post, not true. WikiLeaks has a long-documented relationship with Putin. Published in The Guardian, not true. A secret server between Trump and a Russian bank has been discovered. Slate, not true. I mean, Slate's a new site, come on. Uh, yeah, yeah, RT yeah. hacked C-SPAN and caused disruption in its broadcast. Fortune, not mm -hmm. true. Russians hacked into Ukrainian artillery app. CrowdStrike, not true. Russians attempted to hack election systems in 21 states. Multiple news outlets echoing Homeland Security. None of that happened. Links have been found between Trump ally Anthony Scaramucci and a Russian investment fund under investigation. Published by CNN. Not true. So when you have all these things where, like, conservatives really do pay attention to the news more than liberals, in my opinion, by and large. Like, I think that... With in in if you really like compare, let's just compare those two clips. Let's completely stereotype and go everything we are against, and say, let's compare those vice clips of the more voters versus the the black voters that are not voting. Right. Like they're just not even paying attention on the left. The black voters are checked out. They don't care who Doug Jones is. They don't care about their choices. They're just not engaged. They don't care. Which make good candidates to turn into um, to uh, libertarian anarchists because they're you know they're already checked out of the government system. Exactly. Really great candidates, um, but uh, versus the more people who had information, mm -hmm. you know, they knew that there were seven accusers as opposed to four, which is what your average person who just kind of floats through Facebook and picks up news would get. So I think a lot of conservatives, these baby boomer conservatives on the right, like they're reading more. But they're just reading the wrong, like they're reading stuff that's like 
propagandist, and well, then the other thing instead is, of everything and saying, okay, it's all propagandized. Let's read ten different sources from all different sides and get a picture of which is what Wall does. Well, yeah, be, be, because the other thing with it is the liberals they can hear their mainstream their message what they want to hear just about anywhere. Right, it's easy to hear it in mainstream like culture. So like, turn on The Daily Show, listen to like any of the late night talk shows, right. um, cartoons. Saturday uh, Night Live was, was the perfect example of this. Go watch the Saturday Night Live where Keenan plays Santa. It was the cold open for the James Franco. Watch that. And it's these little kids coming up talking about politics. And by the end of it, the entire message is you must hate Trump and you must be a liberal to be a good person. Otherwise, you're on the naughty list. And, like, that's a very real cultural thing where people just like that impression. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so society says that I must be these things to be a good person. I better virtue signal this way. Mm -hmm. And so I better find things, these little nuggets that kind of fit into that that I can be outraged about. Correct. Yep. Yep. And, and, and as a conservative or someone who think, just thinks against that or thinks counter to that, you have to keep getting your news from different outlets. So you've got to keep getting more and more information. And then... You still don't even trust um, Fox News all the way because it's like, well, if they're lying to me too, sure, they can be lying to me. Too. They are also possibly lied to. Me. I'm looking at that Brett Bear, Brett Bear suspiciously because he has on politicians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, then at the end of the day, you have like, well, I need someone to distill all this down to me, and let, let me find out. Let me who's moving the Overton window to the furthest right, taking this to a crazy conclusion. So you watch InfoWars, right? And you're like, whoa, okay, that's too far. Let's back that up. <laughs> all right, now I've got my opinion. All right, uh, all right. <laughs> I think I've settled on what's, what's a gateway pundit. I'm, I'm, I'm good at gateway pundit here. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to keep bouncing around and grabbing different stories from different people because you're trying to find that balance. And that's when, and now granted, in this new age of like new media, YouTube and different talk shows like podcasts, like Wall, and um, that's it. Um, no one, <laughs> no else. one else. No one else. Fuck uh, Roger Paxton. Who, Roger who? <laughs> exactly. Oh, Take your little audience and beat it. <laughs> Lions of what? Uh, anyways, um. And you take these little nuggets, and then you, they're they're doing that. They're helping distill it from these different different sources, aggregate them together, distill it together, and come up with these different opinions. And that's, and it's, regardless, of, you guys have to do a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. To be honest, it's easy to be liberal. Let it is. the government do it. Yeah, they're right. I'm wrong. Yeah. Sure, that's easy. That's it's, easy. You could check out and be easy. That's easy. It's like Jimmy Kimmel. You know, Jimmy Kimmel brings out a, his cute kid this mm -hmm. week and, and says, you know, they're trying to get rid of CHIP funding, Children's Health Insurance Program. And there's no way that Jimmy Kimmel, a millionaire who lives in Los Angeles, has a kid on CHIP. Right. Like, but the message just gets through because he's got a cute baby next to him. Right. And instead of, like, Jimmy Kimmel reading an article about any of this and understanding the actual policy of it, he just has a cute kid on stage, and Ben Ben Shapiro did a great job of like breaking down all the headlines of Vanity and ver mm -hmm. or ver Variety and Vanity Fair and the New Yorker and like all these sites and Slate and all these sites that your liberal friends share, like saying, "Oh, Jimmy Kimmel made a brave s uh, stand for children's health insurance." Bravo! Because who's against children's health insurance? And the government is there to fix it, mm -hmm. and nobody actually like said, "Is you right?" Like, is the ideology right? Is the facts that he's spewing, are they right? Like, right, yeah. they didn't. They and just said, cute kid, Republicans hate health insurance and children, and mm -hmm. being liberal is great. Yep. And totally ignoring the uh, Shriners Hospital. Right. Totally ignoring uh, the Ronald McDonald House. The Riley, you know, totally ignoring, yeah. right, all these other private institutions that take care of kids. Or in totally ignoring Everyone else in the world wants children to be taken care of, okay? Right. And that, that, that charity of Americans, of just people in general, just ignoring all of that and like, nope, need a force of the guns to do that. Yeah. Everyone hates kids. We need guns. If we, don't, if we don't use guns to take money from people, you know, kids are going to die in the street. Yeah. And it's like, that's a very lazy answer. Very. It's a, yeah. Yeah, it's a very lazy. Yeah, very. I understand your solution is great. I like the idea of, yes, we need to collect, we need to get, collect money. To help kids, I like the solution. It's your method, the way you want to do it. That's where I have the problem. So I, I was, uh, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. You're good. Good. So I was. Uh, so a lot of times I come home and I just turn on YouTube and I start watching that. YouTube. And, yeah, so I'll watch YouTube to kind of watch various things. And so 
I watched uh, some Alex Jones just to see what he was saying about some of the Russia stuff. And then it ended up leading into CBN. And I ended up watching Pat Robertson's newscast for about 30 minutes, which is hilarious because Pat Robertson's 90 and they've got him like literally seat belted into the chair. And uh, it was actually a nice little newscast. And I'll tell you what. If you compare that 30-minute CBN newscast to the NBC newscast, if you watch the NBC newscast, you're getting the same news that you're getting at the ABC, CBS, PBS, MSNBC, CNN newscasts, who all read it from the New York Times, the Washington Post. It's very vertical. And so when you go and watch a CBN you i i learned like several different things going on in the world that i didn't see in like traditional broadcast media outlets like like cnn is just fully focused on the russia investigation that's it that's, that's it. it that's literally all it is and roy moore and republicans and democrats it's very it's very geared into getting ratings mm-hmm. but like the cbn's the democracy now's the alex jones of the world the i like the nhk especially with all this north korea stuff the yeah korean um um NHK's Japan, Japan. Is it Japan? Yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. their Japanese. But they don't I, make good food. I watched a Nigerian on Facebook Live. I watched a Nigerian debate about their president. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going too far. Like, I, I cannot wait for vacation to de de plug from this because, like, now I'm finding Nigerian politics interesting, and I'm getting too far. I need to dial it back a bit. But my point is, is that these newscasts, these alternative newscasts give you something that is novel and different and you learn something and you go, oh, okay, I'm going to tune in. I'm going to check this out. And that's why I watch a lot of these alternative news because you do. you Yeah, you get, like, the basics of what's going on in the news, but you also, like, see something about Palestine and Jerusalem and what's going on there now that you wouldn't have seen anywhere else. And it is from a pers- a different perspective, but it's not that same, like, homogenized mainstream media outlet. And... You know, that's where I think it, it it's a, it's a good thing that you have a We're Libertarians, you have a Democracy Now, you have an Infowars, you have a CBN, that we have some we have the ability to to watch all these things because you get a different point of view than something else. Podcasts are great for that. Um, you know, listen to the commentary podcast today, and they were talking about how we're eight weeks out from the worst mass shooting in American history, and we know less today about why he shot people than. And there's three timelines in the hotel, and nobody's talking about it because we're all obsessed with uh, Roy Moore's penis. Like, and it's a great point. Like, how did this happen? Why did this guy do that? We don't know. Was it, was it ISIS? We don't know. So, uh, we need to do a uh, final thought from Glenn Greenwald, and then we're going to do Harry's tech tip from the Hacker News here. Uh, U.S. media outlets are very good at demanding respect, and let me just say. The media is the most self-righteous bunch. (laughs) So annoying. They love to imply, if not outright state, that being patriotic and a good American means that one must reject efforts to discredit them and their reporting because that's not how one defends press freedom. And I say hogwash. Yep, just like the whole CNN. You're not if you're not a member of the media, you can't access these emails. Right. You're supposed to have these. Right. Cool. I am the media. Right, literally started a podcast six years ago, and now we're in the top five, percent, top one percent of all podcasts. Go fuck yourself. Yep. And if you send in shows to, um, then we have terrorist state. Get your producer. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so Harry's so, tech tip this week. The ju- at just the tip. We can You can only handle a little bit of Harry and his tech tips because if he put in more than gave you more information, things would start tilting too far. Now, um, all right. So I'm bringing this one up. Uh, now this also goes into something of uh, the conversation I've been having on the Discord, which, um, like I said, like uh, it st- stuff happens in the Discord that don't happen anywhere else. What happens in the Discord? So, so if you're not one of the the people that are in the Discord, you don't hear me talk about this different stuff. But I'm going to go into this right now. All right, on the Hacker News, collecting a collection of 1.4 billion plain text leaked passwords found circulating online. Um, that seems bad. Oh yeah, I and mean, it's in plain freaking text that they. Which fa- means uh, that's searchable, right? Yes, it's plain. Yeah, it's searchable. So Ooh. it's not encrypted. It's not like so. If you uh, this basically, uh, uh, security researchers found on the dark web was a bunch of uh, 
what is it like 1.4 billion like different passcodes on there and so there's different so they found passwords on there great place great website to find out if your password is on this list so you don't have to go on the dark web or try to download this 1.4 billion uh, for 1.4 billion plain text file is to go on have i been pwned there's great different security researchers that take care of this website um, i'm gonna make sure to try to get chris to, um, um, to link this one but have i been pwned you put in your email address and if your email address has been involved in a like recent like attack just like something like this it goes on there and you know tells you so you can change your passwords um, they've changed a lot of the password tracing structure so i used to come on here and hamper people to change pass change your passwords well they, they uh, different people have changed my mind first the nsc have changed their standard on you know you don't have to change your password every month that's, it, that's why has explain that because one, uh, people were, they found out, um, just like in this report too, it even showed it, that people were either using the same password everywhere or reusing passwords or having a password standard. So let's say you were using Roger Paxton 69, okay? Okay. And your month is over and you need a new password, so you use Roger Paxton 70, Roger Paxton 80, Roger Paxton 90. And you know, if you get enough of the, you, so you collect enough of these passwords, like, okay, this this is how this guy makes passwords. So it's just easier. Right. Um so, all right. So there's just more stuff to it. I'm not, I can go in. The, I'm just trying to. We just go, the, just the tip. I, I'm trying to go quick on this. So right, just the tip. Please don't tweet at me and go like, "Well, that's not all of it in that report." I, and I know <laughs> I've read we're it. just doing the tip here. But the the biggest thing on the report is also how people make passwords. When they were searching this thing, they noticed uh, that a lot of people were still using admin, admin, root admin. Um, let's see, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six. One two three four five six seven eight nine password one qwerty password one 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 let me in yeah let me in as passwords and that's the biggest problem of a lot of um, IoT devices uh-huh. is that Inter- lot- Internet of Things Internet of Targets so like your smart your smart fridge your Alexia your Goofy um, let's see your Internet connected you know webcam L- a lot of these people don't switch out that. Um, uh, that default password right. and that's the main reason like if you're not that good into tech you've got to uh, you, you either have a firewall installed but that doesn't do you any good if a lot of these things have or uh, stop me if i still go too far no they there's exactly. a um they use a protocol so that device can easily connect to the internet so you can access anywhere so if you've got a webcam that goes hey you can access this anywhere well it's using a p uh what is it you what is it called UPnP. I can't uh, think of the top You of my don't head. know. I'm not um, gonna know. Uh, it uses the protocol. <laughs> I'm probably gonna get like hit with this right now because I can't remember the stupid protocol. It uses, uh, I think it's UPnP, and it uses it to breach the firewall to, to connect things online. Well, since that thing touches the net, if you still have the default password on this thing, if someone finds this thing out there, they use that default password to dial in. And that is basically one thing they did find out in this whole hack is that a lot of people still have all these. You know, basic passwords, the default passwords still on, or such easy crackable passwords, passwords that are easily in there. Um, there's so many different ways to make passwords. I could, I will try to, I will come up with a script to teach people how to make a better password. Um, the it's like I said, like this is. I'm trying to go quick on all this stuff, but a lot of stuff is very important. And if you're thinking you're, and they're also finding out that a lot of people are using the same password over multiple accounts. So if you use your same password that you used for your Netflix, your LinkedIn, your MySpace, your Friendster account, your YouPorn, and your um, Pornhub account, guess what? You know, like, so if they take it from one area, someone's just going to move it across. So, and it's real important for now because a lot of people have gotten into Bitcoins, gotten into different cryptocurrency, and if you use the same password you used for your um you porn account well guess what someone's going to get into that because those, not know. my you porn account yeah, you're, don't yeah. get in there yeah so they're uh, so those so that's what they're finding out and you're very so it's, and it's come on people it's 2017 get onto a <laughs> password manager um so last right. pass you can use last pass free. if you it's want if, if yeah it's it's okay it does an okay job um i like to use a little black book me- method i write my passcodes in a little black book and i put my ass cheeks on it i walk around with an ability to destroy it in an instant book and matches extremely paranoid you are well, um, the other thing is, well, like if it's LastPass, if well, you give, if you lose access to your LastPass, you lost access. Someone breaks into that, or if you that password is, I've just, I'm very 
LastPass has been hacked. I've never had a problem. Now, when LastPass did get hacked, uh, they never like they did salt and made sure the the password that they held in the database was very encrypted, which mm-hmm. was, you know, hard, um, but you know, it's still everything has that possibility, and someone can leave something on. Just like Apple had the last um, their last vulnerability. You probably got these. Hopefully, you got these updates. Oh, I update immediately. Um, the second there's an update, they escalated Listen, the vulnerability. This is, this is Spangles' tip, okay? Spangles' tech tip. All right, because I'm not Harry, but I do know a little. All right, I'm a digital director by day. I do this all by night. It, you got to update your apps and your phone. All yeah. these people walking around out there going, oh, I'm just too cool to update my phone. Especially if you're on Android. Uh, yeah, like Apple does have like vulnerabilities, but Android especially has vulnerabilities. Up the wazoo. And if you're not updating your phone, you're not updating your your vi- your antivirus software essentially like you have to update your phone you have to update your apps you have to like it not only will the quality of your user experience improve not only will uh, will iOS 11 had bugs well they're all fixed now yeah they're all fixed now it depends on the update some AMD graphics driver updates suck hate you AMD <laughs> but the point is you. is you've got to update your computer your phone like I see people walking around with hundreds of unupdated apps, and it's mm-hmm. like they're running iOS five, and they're like, "I'm just too cool to be on 11." It's like, well, you're too cool to have a bank account because right. they're going to steal your money if you don't right. update this stuff. So basically, if uh, Spangle doesn't have the new update on his Apple device, he on his like laptop, if he locked it, I could just walk in over, hit the word root, and log into the sucker. Rick Irvine, I have 148 apps to update. It would take too long. That's another problem. If you're a loser who has that many apps on their phone, um, you're you you, ha- you created a vulnerability just because you yeah. have spread out so much that way. You yeah. so basically. Your attack venue is up to 164. One of these apps are broken. There, you, let's play a game. You need to delete <laughs> delete apps that you don't use yeah. from your phone. If you don't use it, get rid of it. Like I, I keep stuff on my iPad, but I never on my iPad log into anything financial. Yeah. Ever because I I have a bunch of apps on there, and there are a ton of apps that are made in Russia and China and cheap places to make apps. Mm-hmm. And they are, they are just, you're just, you have a port to Russia sitting on your phone that you're not using. Because if it's on your phone, they can get into your phone. So if you're not using apps, you need to clear those off. You have 148 apps. No, yeah, what you, kind you, of ignorant yeah. shit is that, Rick Irvine? Yeah, the other thing is like, it's like, well, I need this app. Do you need, do you use it every day? Do you switch to all 148 apps? Right. Or do you also have the ability to be on Wi-Fi, unless you're at the Wall Studios, you have high-speed internet access, (laughs) and you can download a new app. You can download that app back again eventually when you need to use it again. You know, I've got an app that I use for workouts. I delete this thing. I deleted it several different times. I'm I'm my fitness pal. If I stop using it for a month, I delete it. Yeah. I reinstall it later because I don't trust it. I try to use the mostly the... Um, just like in the if you get the book, the Dark Android Project, they also and they yeah, and they talk about like just trying to use the apps that are just on your phone. You like so it's like these are like the base apps. Trying to lower your attack, um, your attack vector, just lower that a little bit to, and they're already using minimal of apps. You, just you, like I um I uninstalled the I'm getting ready to install Instagram, the Instagram app, but I've uninstalled the Facebook app. For the simple fact that it's, I'd rather just go through the browser. Right. I'd rather just go through the browser. And a lot of the different apps is like, wow, I can access most of this browser site. News apps especially. Like, I don't have a lot of news apps yeah. anymore. Like, some of, like, the, you know, uh, curated apps are really cool. But, mm-hmm. like, if you're – if you you don't need the Drudge app on your phone. Yeah. You you can just go to the Drudge website. It looks exactly the same. Like, yeah. use – Yeah, especially if it's a small company. Like, like, I love the little app for my Wi-Fi pineapple that um, they made from, from Hack5. It's beautiful. It's awesome to tether to your pineapple. It's beautiful. But then at the end of the, at the end of the day, I start thinking like, wait a minute, what is it like? Ten people on this team? How many people are looking at this thing patching holes? This thing does get updated, but like, I uninstalled it. The one of them, I was like, wow, this is cool. Right. Uninstall. I'll just access my pineapple to the web. <laughs> All right. Final thoughts for this episode, Harry. <sighs> um, when it comes down to it, um, I think the. I think a lot of solutions between police officers and non-cops can be solved just by like everyone just bringing the humanity back and everything to seeing each other as two different humans interacting with each other. And also that cops and everyone else, just when they have a disagreement, they basically see cops get away with things that they normally can't, and that creates a divide. Mm-hmm. So 
and that's that's and then that's unfortunately on the cop's shoulders to try to bring that to over to their side to bring over that now granted that you know that implied immunity that they have the immunity that 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 is where the distrust has that's where that's where a lot of it breed from that's where a lot of it comes from you just completely got distracted rick you just completely distracted him yeah uh, yeah yes yes rick Rick and was like yeah he listened to sovereign tech that's the tech podcast i listen to it's really really good also listen to steve gibson um security now um the other thing i want to give a shout out to the discord channel um you know it's uh we're hit over a hundred people in the discord woo 100 people got over 100 people in discord we're gonna keep growing next next move is 250 people in discord so get people in the discord it's a lot of fun um we had a huge bitcoin discussion in the discord um this afternoon we did some gaming also uh let's see i uh, also want to give a shout out to um the uh, stone who try to serenade us in the voice chat while we're trying to do stuff um that's you know, he was off key, so it's possible nap violation. I'm going to talk to you later about that <laughs> later. If you're off key, is that a nap violation? But other than that, um, I just also wanted to say uh, thank you for all you guys who do listen and respond back to the things I bring on the show. Uh, Spangle says a lot of people do like a lot of the topics I bring up, a lot of my um, opinions. And you know, I want you to get, want you guys to say uh, thank you. Um, I didn't. I get scared sometimes when I sit in front of this microphone. It's easier when I've got a headset on my head and I'm just gaming. I just say, oh, I'll say what the heck I want. But <laughs> doing it here, it's a, I really I just want to say thank you. Well, I'm I'm straight politics. Like, I love politics. It's what I, I'm really into. And so I like Harry because Harry brings a different perspective of stuff that uh, I would miss. So so thank you to Harry. Uh, and hopefully, um, I'm trying... There will be my final thoughts. There will be no shows for the rest of the year after Thursday's show. A fortnight. Uh, uh, I'm taking a fortnight sabbatical. So every December, uh, I get vacation from uh, the 15th through the 2nd. So during those times, we always take the show off. We traditionally have not done shows at the end of the year, and I'm going to carry on that tradition because I'm doing even more now. <laughs> I'm working <laughs> even more hours. I'm doing even more talking. And uh, I just need to be a person and not read politics or news or any of that stuff for a couple weeks just to, just to take a break. And uh, this affords me the time where I get to just kind of go and watch Hitler documentaries and think about stuff w- without a linear pattern. So, uh, But I think we're putting out more than enough that you probably have to get caught up on anyway, so I'm sure a, a, a break will be nice for you. I will actually be doing a show on the 29th. Uh, I've got a, a cool test show that we're going to do that uh, essentially what, what I want to do next year is promote candidates, uh, both Republican, Democratic, Libertarian, Independent, school board candidates of Libertarian persuasion, uh, party agnostic, but you have to be a Libertarian, uh, that... If you're a candidate, I'd like you to reach out to me at editor editor at wearelibertarians.com because essentially what I'm going to do is I've got a couple friends who are political uh, strategists and candidate you know trainers and and just a couple of guys who are very long standing Mark Rutherford you know uh, Michael Dixon and what I want to do is I want to bring them in and I want them to judge two candidates facing off. All right, so you're, I'm going to have two candidates come in, and I'm going to ask them questions, and we're going to solicit questions from uh, the audience, and these two candidates will get critiqued and answered questions, and then I'm going to work out some way to have a, a way, it's a way to promote candidates to our audience, but also a way to raise money for these candidates, um, and the winner will get, you know, some some money i have i haven't fleshed it all out so so what we're going to do is a test show on the 29th to kind of flesh this idea out so um there's a business show where you have a pitch and that's sort of kind of what i'd like to do so that's kind of where i'm heading with this so uh the 29th i will do an episode but other than that i will be off uh and kind of uh, i'm sure i will be online tweeting facebook posting all that stuff discording 
But uh, I'd, I would like Harry to host a show. So if you want Harry to host a, a, a couple shows, then please get in the Discord and tell Harry he needs to do his job. But uh, I think you guys during the holidays could use a couple weeks of wall off. Um, big thank you to Jordan Laycock, who went from $5 a month up to $10 a month. Rick Irvine, who went from $10 a month up to 25 mm. Nick Economopoulos, who went from 10 to 25 And Brandon Luke, who pledged $500 in the last few days, uh, we lost the Patreon plan is changing, as we discussed at the beginning of the last episode. So I uh, lost a few people, and you guys more than made up for it. So I greatly appreciate you guys covering that uh, and to keep the income flowing. Basically, before I was, as the creator on Patreon, I was carrying 85% of the cost. Like, I was getting 85% of the pledge money. Now I'm going to get 95 and they're going to do that by offsetting the charges and putting the charges on your end. So, like, it's going to be five fifty instead of $5. And what that does is that basically shifts the burden from half you, half me, to instead of all me on the creator end. So it's a good thing for We Are Libertarians, and it really does uh, keep things consistent for us creators. I, I, I know that it is going to be annoying for some people because if I give you $5, I want you to take $5. So, um, so I, I do get that, but I appreciate you guys sticking with Wall and helping fund this. And uh, especially our $100 a month subscribers, Brandon Luke, Christy Avery, Craig DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, our $25 folks, Brantley Spicer, Rick Irvine, Nick Economopoulos, Chad Oakage, Joey Turner, Pete Jones, Carly Ernst, Brandon Kester, Heidi Aldridge, Christian Emmons, Dan Dunbar, Doug Stream, Christopher. Oops. It's not you, Christopher. Uh, I just had a little belch. Um, Christopher broke off and Todd Singer. Can't um, handle your Perrier, huh? Yeah, I know. I know. And then on Thursday, we're talking Bitcoins for Dummies. So if you've got questions about Bitcoin that you want answered, there is a thread on the public Facebook page of We Are Libertarians. Leave your comments and questions. I've got two Bitcoin experts, and I've got... Uh, me, who doesn't know anything about Bitcoin, and then uh, another person, Kristen, who's coming in, who, do, who wants to know stuff about Bitcoin. Jesse Riddle will be here, and, uh, and then a TVD. Uh, uh, I just forgot his name. I, basically, I'm, I'm over the next few months, you're going to hear a lot of new faces locally, a lot of new libertarians trying out some new co-hosts. So let me know who you like and who you don't. So, all right. Thank you for joining us here on We Are Libertarians. I appreciate you guys so much. Appreciate it. If you found this worthwhile and you learned a lot, then please, or a little, please share it on your Facebook. You are helping us grow. We appreciate it so much. And please join our communities at wearelibertarians.com. And until then, be good to each other. Okay. 148 apps on my phone. 148 apps. What a 